What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. On today's episode, we sit down with Colt Wrangler, who is a fabricator for Revival Cycles out of Austin, Texas. Now, you might have heard of Revival. They are the ones that put on the hand-built show down in Austin as well. Colt has a podcast, Colt Wrangler Radio, and he's also a bullfighter. So this dude's got a whole mix of wild shit that he's into and uh, honestly makes for a great podcast. And in this episode, we talk about his childhood growing up in the rodeo circuit with his family, all the way up into how he managed to get himself into custom-built motorcycles, or at least making them himself. Also, guys, if you don't mind, go check out our sponsors down below in the description where you can use our offer codes to save yourself some money on parts for your bike and for you as a rider. You'll also be helping us create more content by using these offer codes, which will keep these guys supporting us, which will keep us making stuff for you. So check them out. We appreciate it. And uh, now let's get to this podcast with Colt Wrangler. All right, here we go. Dude, I had a, I had a, a chick randomly send me a picture saying, I felt cute tonight. No shit? And, like, I was like, I don't know who this is. I just deleted it. But was she cute? No. Oh, okay. And then my watch, <laughs> my Apple watch, was sitting at the house, and it popped up on my Apple watch, and oh. my wife flipped the phone. Oh, yeah, out. so you're married. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, that, that didn't... I laughed at first when she kind of confronted me. She's like, what the fuck? Will the picture come up on yeah, Apple Watch? Yeah. Oh, so she could tell, like, this bitch ain't. Yeah. I mean, obviously. I, I was like, babe, come on, dude. I'll just jerk off. Yeah, <laughs> <Seriously>. right. <laughs> yeah, what if it was a really hot chick? You'd be really in trouble then. Or not even a hot chick, but, like, a good-looking chick. Yeah. And then your wife saw that and it popped up. Dude, fuck. I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, at least if, if it happens and it's a chick that's ugly, at yeah. least you could be like, come on. Really? Really? I don't want to waste my time doing that. Yeah. And uh, then she'll pull that fact on you and she'll be like, you know, they say that 90% of the time, like, they husband cheats on somebody who's not as attractive. You know, you know that fucking yeah, statistic? Yeah. I guess you can't win either way. So. No, you really can't, man. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a strange one. Yeah, it just kind of, like, the wrong number thing is it could ruin somebody's life. My, my wife's reasonable, so she <laughs> didn't. She kind of like, what the fuck? And then you know reality set back in really quick and she came to her senses like yeah of course i'm not you know what i mean dude so. the the amount of relationships that have ended because of apple products being connected <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'd like to see a statistic on that i bet it's pretty fucking large dude but <laughs> i mean i got i got the i'm i'm sucked into the apple ecosphere how the fuck you want to say it uh-huh mac uh Mac Studio at the shop, iPad at the house, watch on the wrist, phone in my pocket, MacBook on the road, and you ain't I getting away with shit. Yeah, on it's that. like the shit's always popping up. Uh huh. Oh, it's a mess, man. But it's part of it, man. It's like, you know, you know what I, my excuse is? I like AirDrop. Oh, I love AirDrop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, fuck yeah, it. I'm going all all Mac. You on can everything. AirDrop without like, oh yeah, for sure. But you can AirDrop without connecting your stuff to where it sends the text messages yeah, that yeah. pop up and all that stuff, right? Well, it's like you know when you're doing like photography and videos and all this shit you airdrop <clears> into your other products and it's complete quality it's like 100 it's not yeah. compressed mm -hmm. so you're not like sending over a shitty version of the photo you just took or something so i just use it for that it's easier to like edit a podcast on a laptop and then send airdrop it over to the macbook pro or whatever i mean the uh the studio and then do some photoshop or whatever you know what i mean 100%. like it's just easier yeah don't connect your shit if you're gonna be running around though yeah I, I, I'm a good boy, so it's all good. Yeah, yeah. Like, no no hot girls ever come up to me, so it's uh, all good. Oh, man. No, the, uh, uh, I had a, uh, uh, ex of mine, but we're, we're good, but, but the boyfriend that she had before me, um, he, uh, that's how he told on himself. He, his, he had left his iPad at her house, and then he was like oil field guy. And, you know, had some chick out in, like, fucking West Texas. And she's in San Antonio. Yeah. You know, and they were meeting up or whatever while he's at work or, or out on the job, you yeah. know. And the fucking messages came can, up. Can you trust an oil field guy? I mean, really? No, no, no. Yeah, no, no, come no. on, dude. Yeah, you go no. to If you've been to uh, Midland, <laughs> Odessa, man, it's just, it's, they prey on that meat out there. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, it, it, it happens. So... 
first off, Colt, thank you for doing this, man. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to, my machinist, Justin, linked us up. I knew who you were beforehand, right? Because I, I've heard of you through the Handbuilt Show before. Um, and early on when I started this podcast, some people said, hey, you should go do one with you. And I think at the time you were still in San Antonio doing some stuff. I probably was. San Antonio yeah. and New Braunfels. Is- yeah, that area. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember who it was that, that like mentioned, you know, reaching out to you, but I, man, I just, I got so wrapped up into fuel injected motorcycles and fucking baggers and all this other crazy shit. And then when you came back on the radar, man, these, these, the work, the, the, the fabrication, all this stuff was like pretty mind blowing, man. I think you've been going down the rabbit hole on your accounts and like, fuck dude, I, I love it. And, and you're doing all this stuff out of aluminum? Is that what it is? Yeah, I try to do, like, non-corrosive stuff as much as possible because then you, you have, have the option of not yeah. coating it, you know, and you can you can polish it, you can brush it, you know, whether it's stainless or aluminum or yeah. titanium, you know. But for me, with the metal shaping, I started, I learned on aluminum, yeah. and uh, I just haven't found a reason to yeah, just shape with steel or anything else. Yeah. yeah, and if ever I'm building the bracket or something, I'm usually doing it with stainless and... Mm-hmm. Like, there's just no reason. This looks good, too, when you weld it up and it you get some great. color in it. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I guess for the sake of myself and the audience, man, like, what, how do you come up in the rodeo, basically, like you did, and then find yourselves metal shaping? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I'm saying? How long we got, dude? <laughs> dude, uh, should I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm good. I'm only, I'm, I'm here, buddy. Dude, we're drinking, man. We're this doing is going to go on. I'm ready. Let's I'm ready go. to party. <laughs> um, I'll have to probably piss like a few times That's throughout cool. I this got thing. pause on this stuff, so uh, we're good. Hell yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so I grew up, both my parents uh, rodeoed professionally. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and, man, my parents have a crazy story, so. Yeah, I was watching a video about your mom doing, was it the horses that she would ride? Like, like. So my mom, uh, she rode uh, bulls and okay. bareback horses. That's the bareback horses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she kind of got well known for doing that. Um, and that was in the, the eighties, uh, with the women's professional rodeo association. And, uh, yeah, a lot of times back then they didn't have like special stock for the women that they would Mm -hmm. bring. It was like, you would just get on whatever they had. And a lot of the guys didn't really care for the women riding that much. And so they would actually put them on some rank shit to try to see them, you know, get slammed. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, my mom, she's, she's tough and, and, uh, Anyhow, so she kind of uh, got known doing that, and then on the rodeo trail, she she met my dad, who was um, riding bulls in the PRCA at that time. Mm-hmm. And my dad grew up in Fort Worth as like a foster kid, mm-hmm. and bounced around, and then started like, you know, doing tile with some guys in Fort Worth, like in high yeah. school and just out of high school. And a couple of those guys were bull riders, and so he just started getting on and was a natural at it. Yeah. And then in Fort Worth, you know. You can yeah. be, go to Billy Bob's, and I think there was another place over there called Cowbell at the time, and, like, there's a bunch of yeah. stuff. And so, uh, you know, he he uh, uh, ended up going pro pretty quick mm. and um, and then met my, met my mom. I think they actually met at Billy Bob's. For real? Yeah. So my mom was born in Alaska but, uh, but grew up in the Ozarks in Missouri. Yeah. And... Um, Anyhow, so, you know, she's got a, a pretty wild life story, and my dad does, too. My dad has a really wild, like, urban kind of, yeah. like, upbringing story, you yeah. know? So, anyhow, um, they, they get together, and so I grew up traveling um, from rodeo to rodeo with them. And then, uh, you know, by the time, I don't know, that, you know, not too long after me, I'm the youngest. I got an older brother, Tiger. Tiger Tough Lions is his name. And Colt Wrangler Lions is my full name yeah and uh so is it colt as a first and wrangler as a middle is the middle nice. yeah yeah um so i know people get caught up on that um but yeah so i like the name choices though she went all in on it they went all in yeah. man it ain't you know they're different <laughs> they're <laughs> definitely different unique though that's awesome man. It, it is i had a really unique childhood so <clears throat> um anyhow they you know they were rodeoing and then by the they didn't rodeo too long after I was born. Um, but by that time they basically, my mom got into, cause she was a singer. She got into entertainment Mm -hmm. in the rodeo world 
to where she was uh, singing music and stuff off a of horseback at oh, these rodeos cool. and then doing uh, uh, cowboy church services on Sunday. So my mom was actually like a preacher. Nice. And a, and a, and a singer and an ex-bull rider. And then my dad, once ever, whenever he quit riding, um, he started getting into the production side mm -hmm. to like s support my mom through it. And then a lot of these pro rodeos would end up hiring him to do the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, my every summer I had till I was like 13 or 14 was I was gone yeah. like the whole summer and uh, sometimes through the school year. So they put me in like a private school. Um, in a small town. So I graduated with, uh, there wasn't a graduating class for like two years before me. <laughs> and then there was me. And then like halfway through the year, there was some girl that, that, uh, transferred in. Transferred in. Um, and so we real super small private school and you know, like it was so small town. It was so country that like, if we were, if it was hunting season, like we could bring our hunting rifles to school and the principal would lock them in his office. Where was this at? Mason, Texas. Mason, Texas. What's that close to that most people would know? Uh, so Fredericksburg is okay. about, I don't know, 35 miles south of there. Okay. Like I, southeast of Mason. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not too far from like Enchanted Rock and all that, huh? Yeah, exactly. Real okay. central. Um, actually, it's, it's pretty close to the geographical center of the state. Nice. nice. Um, so anyhow, yeah, went to a school like that, and, and that was convenient for my parents because they were able to take us on the road, and I could do my, my school yeah. on the road. Sorry, I got a burp. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I vocalize everything, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, you know, that was, my, that was my childhood. It was like growing up doing that stuff, and then naturally I got into rodeoing, and uh at these pro rodeos, they would always have like mutton busting and stuff. You know, that's a crowd favorite. Yeah. And I just grew up idolizing all these rough stock riders. And my parents were rough stock riders. And so I started competing, riding calves when I was probably about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And then I rode steers. And then I kind of like didn't really do anything for a couple of years, didn't really care too much. And then I started riding uh, junior bulls when I was probably 13, I think. So for someone like me who is from the city, mm -hmm. <laughs> like the concept of the rodeo stuff, what is it based around? I know it has something to do with some of the stuff that they do on ranches and stuff for breaking horses and things like that. But is the rest of it kind of show or is there like any like not to I'm showing my ignorance here, right? No, so, go ahead. Um, is 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 it all for show or is there some of that stuff that translate into like you know, doing cowboy shit out on ranges and stuff like that. Well, it all, it all came from real cowboy shit, you know, okay. and, and slowly developed into, uh, you know, certain events yeah, yeah. that, that have certain rules and different, different, um, uh, it's, it's a lot like, like racing, yeah. you know, where there's different associations and a lot of those associations will have their own rule book, have their own things. And sometimes they'll have, an event that maybe another association won't have. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the, the grandfather of all of that is the PRCA, the, mm. uh, professional rodeo cowboy okay. association. Um, and so that's, that's basically the worldwide standard is them and everything else kind of branches off that. And then the PBR, which a lot of people yeah, see yeah. is just bull riding. And it was a lot of bull riders from my dad's era in the eighties that, that okay. started that and branched that off of the PRCA and uh, it was the first standalone bull riding. So yeah, it's all those events have just morphed and become something. Um, the, the thing that's probably the most true to like stuff that actual working cowboys do is uh, ranch rodeos, mm -hmm. which is a whole different thing. It's more of a team event. Okay. Yeah. And it, so there will actually be ranch hands from a ranch that forms a team of like probably four to six guys mm -hmm. and then they'll compete against another ranch mm -hmm. and there's a there's associations for that and okay. then there's events within that like wild cow i went i'd actually worked or didn't work i uh competed at one of them um because there's usually a uh, ranch bronc riding mm -hmm. in it and which is 
it's complicated, but like ranch bronc riding started in ranch rodeos to where it's bronc riding, but you're not in a competitive saddle that's geared just towards yeah. bucking horses. You're actually just riding a regular saddle like you would ride on a ranch, okay. which is totally different. Um, so it'd be like racing with a motorcycle that's like a stock motorcycle yeah, versus yeah. racing with a Modified, very specific yeah. like, you know, track bike. Um, so anyhow, uh, uh, you know, for instance, that ranch bronc riding started at ranch rodeos and now it's starting to make its way into like open pro rodeos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then there's an actual like women's division for ranch bronc riding. So yeah. it's just a big spider web of stuff that's morphed out into different associations and, uh, you know, regionally things can be different as well. And, um, but to answer your question, yeah, it's all morphed from stuff that yeah. happened out, you know, in, yeah. on the range, basically. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, it's been years, but I've been to some down in uh, the stockyards before back in the day when I was younger, and mm -hmm. uh, it's wild. And then, of course, you know, who can, you know, you see it all on TV. I mean, we're, I'm one of the people that's hooked in the Yellowstone verse. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, all that stuff, and. I think for me, it started becoming a little, not necessarily the rodeo stuff, but just that part of what's out there. It's become a lot more appealing f because of my wanting to ride in those type of areas. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then just kind of like now you look at those bunkhouses or ranches that you pass and you kind of have a little bit more of an understanding of what goes on there and you kind of uh, appreciate things a little bit more as you're riding through it. So, right. If that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then going, you know, like Wyoming, that's one of my favorite places to ride, even though. Most of it looks like West Texas for the, for right. the most part. Yeah. Um, but it's still it's still beautiful riding, in my opinion, and it, it, there's a lot of that up there, too, I believe. So, I don't know. It's just, I'm not, like I said, you know, I, I got to ask stupid questions to kind of get no, to the no. point of uh, understanding some of it. So Stupid questions, welcome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and they're not stupid, you know. If you don't know, you don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know, same thing with, my, like, in, and, uh, you know, people do that in the motorcycle world all the time. I feel Some, like someone will say something stupid and, and, you know, people just come down on them and well, it's like, Hey, like <laughs> you didn't know till you knew. This you know? reminds me of like going to watch Sons of Anarchy for the first time and then finally seeing an actual like vested up, you know, patched up biker and being uh -huh. like, Hey man, like, so I've been watching Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Trying to bounce the, what I've seen on TV versus reality kind <clears throat> of situation. Yeah. hundred so percent. You, you know, that's how it feels. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that is uh, that is the uh, Yellowstone of the motorcycle world. Yeah. The, How I got turned on to it was a friend of mine said, "Do you got to check out Yellowstone? It's like Sons of Anarchy for cowboys." <laughs> That's funny, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've seen some episodes of it, and and um, you know, I, I I don't have TV or anything like that or subscriptions. Smart, smart. Um, I just I have too many hobbies, too much stuff yeah. going on, and uh, uh, I don't want to spend any money. I'm a cheap ass. Yeah. Uh, but. It's done wonders for the Western world, to be honest. Yeah, it really has. And and whoever's producing that show has done a great job of, uh, I mean, I've had a handful of friends that have been on it and made little appearances and scenes or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, bullfighters that, you know, they would hire to, you know, be there for safety purposes while yeah, they're yeah. working the cattle or whatever, or like they're doing a rodeo scene and it's like, oh, there's one of my buddies that I know that's like a bullfighter or a bull rider mm -hmm. or, um, and then also it's done wonders for the music world mm -hmm. as well because who, I don't know, whoever's producing the show or writing the show is really tapped into a lot of the, the stuff that spawned from like Red Dirt and Texas Country and yeah. Americana and all that. So, I mean, I got a handful of friends now that uh, I know that are in bands or bands I've played with and different stuff that have like their music on Yellowstone. Yeah. Which is, it's really good. And yeah, it's awesome. just brought a lot of eyes to the Western industry and, um, and it's gotten a lot of interest or it's gotten a lot of young people interested in it because it, it is a dying thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and especially with, with how the world is now, like people, um, you know, it is a rough sport. Yeah. And, it, it involves animals and, uh, it's gotten to where people just don't like that, Yeah, you know, and, and rodeo really has had to fight to stay alive. And, uh, I think shows like that have, have helped and also like, like put those kind of things in, 
in a better light. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the caveat to that. Is it like same thing Sons of Anarchy did for motorcycling? You know, it brought a lot of new eyes to that world, even though it was kind of like uh, some of them went towards the, I want to be a badass, and some of them like, that looks fun. I want to go ride. Mm-hmm. You know right. what I mean? And I imagine there's got to be some of that crossover with, with that stuff as well. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this when I was growing up. I mean, my grandfather, he was born in like 42, and I just remember being, you know, early 80s, being a kid, and he's always watching a Western. You know, it was mm-hmm. always Westerns on, right? And I started thinking about this, like, a, I think about a couple of years ago when Yellowstone first came on, I'm like, those Westerns were, that was like one generation from my grandfather. People were, you know, that was their life. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, the 1800s wasn't that long ago for those, for, for someone that was born in 42. Yeah. I mean, their dad was probably relatively close to their dad or something, depending on how freaky they got. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just like, it seems so close to like, want to relive those, that world of that kind of freedom, if you will, you know yep. what I mean? To society and stuff. So, uh, and I think that it, it's a welcome thing now. It's a, it's because of, you know, everybody wanting to go down that whole path of, you know, just getting away from corporate America mm-hmm. and finding things that are meaningful. I, I've seen so many people in the motorcycle industry kind of go into horseshoeing and all these other trades that are along the lines of dealing with like ranch hand type stuff. You know what I mean? And, right. And uh, I think it's awesome. It is know? awesome. Well, we live in an automated world. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, shit's not supposed to be automated. Yeah. You know, nothing else is. It's, it, you know, it's not for for anything else in in nature really but it you know we've made it to where everything we've taken the struggle out of everything and so i think it's no surprise to see that you know the cowboy lifestyle is is more attractive to people it's just bringing balance yeah that's a good point man i I feel like there's so many things in the world that are people are myself included it's almost like I, I welcome some of the challenges of maybe, you know, my grandfather or his grandfather might have had in life. And I say that very ignorantly. Like, it just seems like, man, I would have rather had that as my challenges rather than, like, trying to keep up a credit score and, you know, not, you know, woke politics and all this other shit. Right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. there's just so many things now that doesn't, it's not, you're not rewarded as, like, you don't get the self-satisfaction in society for the kind of things that, you know, they used to, you know what I'm saying? Right. Now it's like a, we're, we're on the fringe kind of thing of anything that has to do with working with your hands. It seems in some, some cases, you know what I mean? Not all, but I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that, but there's a thought there and I'm just kind of, it's like a rattle can right now. Yeah. I'm trying to get some no, I get there. it. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. No, it's just, it's just, it's just bringing balance, you know? Um, we're meant to struggle. Mm-hmm. We're meant to have to strive for things and, and work hard. And I mean, uh, you know, if you're just, if you know, you're, you're leaving your, your perfectly air conditioned Mm. room, you know, that's got a refrigerator in it full of food that you have no idea how it's even gotten there and it's perfectly packaged. And then, you know, you leave that, that air conditioned room, like I was saying to an air conditioned car, to an air conditioned office and it's artificial light and you know, mm. you're barely walking and, and we, we're just not meant to be yeah. live that way as humans, you know? Um, it, it, so there's a lot of negative effects and you know, of course technology is great. It's great that we've, we've, uh, you know, come this far, but now we're actually having to work to go backwards a little bit to just provide to any balance. sort of balance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, cause it's just, it ain't supposed to be that way. Yeah. Um, you know, but, but like you said about your grandfather and, you know, in hindsight, we're like, and, and I think that way too, a lot of times it's like, man, it's, that was a better time. Like mm-hmm. for me as you know, I just turned 31 and it's like, man, I don't know if, if I would want to have a kid in these times, yeah, yeah. you know, but then again, you know, you think about it and, and, uh, I'm sure that crossed our grandparents' mind and, but, but also it's like for them, I'm sure all they wanted was things to be a little bit easier, you know, yeah. man, if we could make this, you know, if, if, if this process was just a little bit more simple or if, you know, this, that, and the other, and you know, they were working six, seven yeah. days a week, yeah. you know, all the time, like just trying to get ahead. And then we're born into a position where, mm-hmm 
that they couldn't even dream of having. Yeah. There, that is a caveat. That is the, you know, the devil's advocate, if you will. You know what I mean? Right. Um, at the same time, uh, it's like we're, we're living in what they were working for. Exactly. Right. If I, that makes sense. I guess maybe to kind of like add to that, it might be that all this is supposed to happen, but it maybe it was just like, it happened a little faster than our evolution could make changes to our, how we are. You know what I mean? Right. Like, a hundred years ago, there was, there's a lot of things that we use every day that didn't exist. Yeah. You know, which has a, allowed us to innovate more. I right. mean, that's the whole concept. You, you eliminate threats and, and uncomforts in life and you can focus more on creating. But then we're at a point now where, you know, we're struggling. The creators are now being replaced by computers and, and yep. you know, automation and all these other things. So it's fast. like if that happens, which is inevitably, inevitable that it will man, like this world's going to have a lot more of a mental health problem when nobody gets to create. I guess everything's going to turn into like leather work. There's going to be boot makers again. There's going to be all these things because people just need that 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 challenge to create and, and find some kind of purpose within themselves, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't know. No, it, everything, it, you know, technology is, is made everything speed up and every, everything's moving fast and, and it's – it's not, that's not natural. Yeah. You know, things are supposed to move slow and, uh, and things are pro supposed to progress slow, you know? And, and so the fact that so much of our life, like I said before, is automated and it's instant and it's fast is, isn't helping us out that much. Yeah. Hell, it's convenient. You know, I mean, it's not like we're weaning ourselves off of a lot of these modern yeah, conveniences. Yeah, like we're sure. still using them, you know, even, even though like I work with my hands every day, dude, I I still feel like a bitch. I'm like, <laughs> the fact that I get into my truck, it doesn't even have AC or heat. And I'm just like, man, I'm driving like four miles to work. It's like, yeah. I should be like riding a bicycle. I should be like, I'm like, how, I should be struggling more than yeah, I am. You put some obstacles in the way. You know? And yeah. yeah, that's, it's, uh, uh, but I'm not doing it cause I'm kind of lazy, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I, w I, I do think that putting obstacles in your way are important. I mean, did our grandparents have a gym membership? No, dude. You know, like, yeah, yeah uh, you know, people, people are, are having to make things harder on themselves just to be in a better spot. Yeah, I got thick like this just because I wanted to go work out later on. Right, there you so. go. <laughs> yeah, the, that's your obstacle. Yeah, it's like, oh, I, <laughs> yeah. I meant to do this. Yeah, drink a lot of beer and yeah. eat a lot of sweets. That's uh, funny. But, you know, so uh, going down the path of, like, being in the rodeo and stuff, like, you were constantly on the move. Is that, that kind of what you were alluding to that y'all were constantly traveling and things like that doing different shows and, and whatnot? Yeah, we were at least traveling all summer long. Okay. And, um, and then sometimes sporadically throughout, uh, basically the, the off season, the rodeo, which would be, oh shoot, we're in it right now. Um, I wouldn't, I can't name ex the exact months, but for, yeah, there's uh, a good amount of the time we were on the road, and when we weren't, you know, uh, we'd be back home, and I'd, I'd go to school with, you know, 15 other kids or whatever yeah, yeah. it was. And, um, yeah, but that that was great because it allowed me to see a lot of the, you know, shoot, I'd probably been to, you know, I've probably been to 45 of the states in the U.S., nice. you know. Not too much overseas. I've probably been to four or five other countries, but um, dead gum. This Medela is making me burp, dude. I'm sorry. Good. You just got to throw it to the side. But I'm not gonna quit drinking it. Give, give it a little dry burp <laughs> over there. The the audience loves that. Yeah, I do it to them all the time. So um, uh, yeah, if you, if you like the burps and the audio, leave a comment, like, <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I was I was on the road a lot. So it was great because. I got to see a lot of different things, and and um, I, a, lot, a lot of these rodeos we would go to year uh, again and again, and so you know we'd be at some fairgrounds that would be like in Wisconsin, like beside a river, and there's like a wooded area, and we'd go build a fort there, and it would still kind of be there the next summer when we really? came by, and then you would get to meet like local kids, and then they got to where you know, I'd be in Colorado or Wisconsin and I'd have friends there and I'd go stay at their house while yeah. we're at the rodeo and hang out with them. I like looked forward to seeing my friends. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. And so I think that's really affected me quite a bit as an adult.
probably positively and negatively in, in a way because I'm all over the place. I have friends everywhere, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a kind of guy that's like has a super tight group yeah. that I only hang out with. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. kind of like, I got a lot of friends and acquaintances yeah. and different stuff, but I never I'm kind of a loner in a way because yeah, yeah. that, that kind of atmosphere made me, you know, be alone a lot. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Which which made it a little bit hard because it was like, yeah, I was a private school kid, mm-hmm. you know, so there's those stereotypes that are definitely real. Um, but, you know, I was, I was put out in a lot of social situations and had traveled a lot. But then again, at the end of the day, it was still just kind of like me and my family. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, th- there was definitely those times to where it was like, I was just felt like out of the loop growing up, mm-hmm. you know, and when you're in those, those years of, uh, you know, preteens and teens, uh, and you go back home and there's not too many people your age, you know, there, Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it's kind of weird, but I think that that drove me into like learning how to do stuff and just get good at things, Yeah, you know? And so pushed me into like building skill sets and, and getting good at, you know, so did you start kind of creating those kind of habits in high school of wanting to do that stuff, like learn other skills and stuff? Definitely, man. I was like, I would even, uh, I mean, Legos was my favorite toy yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, it was something we could also like take on the road. Mm-hmm. So I was play with those constantly. Our parents didn't really let us have video games or anything until we could afford to buy them ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so by that time, it's like I didn't have any sort of console or thing till I was a teenager yeah and by that time i was already like learning how to break horses and like do other stuff you know so i never got really deep into that kind of into those kind of things but i'd be the kind of kid that would like modify my legos and stuff Mm -hmm. like i would cut them up sometimes and make different pieces that i wanted to and um my brother he's a big gun nerd Mm -hmm. and uh, always wanted to be in the military and um has a career in the military Mm -hmm. you know and uh, it lives, uh, in Italy now permanently, um, in the army, but, um, he was, he was really into, uh, history and different stuff like that and, and, uh, war history. And so we would always, uh, my parents would always take us to a lot of museums and stuff. Nice. And, um, he, he would always make like guns and weapons. So he was three years older than me. And he would, you know, draw out a gun exactly how it was supposed to be and then, like, cut it out in plywood with a jigsaw. Like, Mm -hmm. and then our parents would, they got to a point where they would buy us, like, plywood and, like, duct tape and different stuff for, like, Christmas. (laughs) Because we were always needing materials and stuff to build build things. So my brother would, would, you know, build guns and swords and, you know, we'd make bows and arrows and shoot each other with them and, and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, then as we got a little bit older, it was... Uh, you know, shoot, I bought an, I bought an AK when I was like 13 (laughs) and, uh, uh, that's Texas. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I remember my dad was, uh, we had a pond, uh, at the place we were at, uh, just outside the the backyard. It wasn't a big place, but it was was like 50 acres and there wasn't a lot of neighbors around, but, um, there, uh, my dad was, he liked to fish and he was stocking up that pond, um, with largemouth bass, but we had, we kind of had a turtle problem and, uh, you know, I don't, we'd always shoot them with like a 22 or something. What do, what do turtles do that fucks things up? I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll kill the fish or the eggs or something. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and then they, you know, they'll overtake an area pretty quick. Bro. Uh, they're kind of invasive, I guess. Um, I don't know too much about that stuff, but all I needed to know is that, yeah, it's cool if you shoot them. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I had my little 22 and I would, I would shoot them all the time. And, uh, that was, that was always fun. A little target practice and their little head stick up out of the water. And, uh, you know, got to be a pretty good shot with that Did little 22. afterwards? No, no. <laughs> but like, they may come like on the, on the, on the edge of the water. Like, yeah. you know, they may end up kind of oh, kind of in that area, up, yeah. you know, washing up or yeah. going to the bottom or whatever. Um, I don't think they'd float, but, uh. Anyhow, I remember I had some friends over, and I was, like, showing off. I was like, watch this. And I, I had, like, a, that AK with a 30-round mag, and I just unloaded that thing in a pond, like, shooting at all these turtles and just going a little crazy. Probably killed some fish, too. Huh? I killed all of them. 
My dad was so pissed, dude. The next day, it was just fish all floated up around the bank, like wow. nice bass, too, and stuff. Yeah. It wasn't a big pond. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, stuff like that. And and, and we, me and my brother, we'd always make boats and stuff. Yeah. Because um, we had that little pond, and, and you know, uh, we'd make them out of, like, feed troughs or, like, we made a boat out of plywood one time. Mm -hmm. And like covered it in pool paint, and like saw how long that that would float, you know. Yeah. So we were always creating, we were always making yeah, stuff, keeping ourselves entertained. Uh, my mom would always kick us out of the house mm. a lot. Um, and uh, before that place, we had a place that was like 180 acres, and it would it would just be like, "Don't come inside till I call you to come back yeah. in for dinner or whatever." And so we just had to figure out shit to do. And you know, it wasn't like we could just like run over to our friend's house down the street. Yeah. You know, there was nobody. It was us. We were out there. You know, we're like 10 miles from town or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that it just, that environment, uh, how I grew up just forced us into, you know, keeping ourselves entertained, which ended up us like teaching ourselves skill sets. Yeah. So. Well, you get handy doing it, all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. can imagine like building stuff. I was, I was a fort kid too. Like that was my shit. Like I'm yeah. turning that bush, that row of bushes into a, a, a multi condominium. There's yeah, going to be a fucking yeah. walkway through it. And the big, this is the main hall right here. You know, I used to love that shit when I was a kid. And then, um, you know, working with the hands, man, like it always, that that's one thing I wish I, I, I would, I wish I had more capacity in my mind right now in time. Cause I'd love to build like wood furniture type thing. I've always yeah. been into that. Um, but I would buy like a little, a tool for it here and there. And then I'm just like, man, I just, I'm trying to keep myself from doing it because I have so many irons in the fire right now that yep. it's like, understand. and I become very obsessive of things that I do. So until I get to this point that I want to be like, that's a hundred percent all I want to do. Mm -hmm. And then I, I kind of half ass everything else in my life until that job is done. You know what I mean? So it's not a good thing. Right. <laughs> so. You you have to, you get to a point and it's, it, it is kind of frustrating where you, you have to pick a couple of things. Yeah. You got to put a couple of things to the side and be like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to learn this or, you know, uh, appreciate it from afar. <laughs> right. I can't, I can't bring this extra project in. It's a, you know, great deal or this or that and the other, or, Hey, you know, I would love to have this, but it's like, man, be realistic. Are you going to have time to finish it? And I'm a perfectionist. So it's like, I want everything like to a T or mm -hmm. as, as good as I can do it. Um, depending on what it is. And, and, so I'll know, like, if I dive into something, I won't just slap it back together. Yeah. You know, it'll, it'll take up space for months and months, mm. you know? And, um, yeah, I'll just have to like, I have to check myself all the time. Yeah. What do you, so, I mean, you're doing all this through high school and whatnot. At what point, uh, I guess when you get out of high school, is that when things like get real for you or you have to kind of figure out what are these skills can I turn into a career? Is that kind of what happened or what happened at that point? Yeah. I mean, I didn't really have, you know, we just played around with a lot of stuff. So I didn't have like, uh, you know, skill, a real skill set to where I could like walk into a place and be like, Hey, I know how to do yeah. this, this, and this, and this, you know? Um, you know, I, I just, I guess I, that, well, that was the thing at, at high school and after high school. I was trying to find a place that would facilitate that mm. to where it's like, all right, I, I know I can learn this kind of stuff. I just need to be in an environment and be around people that can teach me things, and I'll know that I can grow into a skill. Yeah. So that was more for me, um, it, you know, through high school and uh, out of high school. That, that was my goal. I mean, I was uh, – uh, there was kind of two things I started doing in high school and that was, I was working at a cutting horse ranch, um, like part time, uh, with some old cowboy guys that, uh, that I knew. And I, at that time I was, I was riding bulls and I was riding saddle bronc horses and, uh, the guys that ran that ranch, they were all, they were like professional, uh, back in the day, they were professional bull riders and, mm -hmm. and bareback riders, saddle bronc riders and stuff like that. And now they were training horses and managing the ranches and stuff. So they were helping me with the rodeo side of things along with my parents. And then also I, my mom is, is big in the horses and, and, you know, uh, is pretty handy with like breaking horse and training mm -hmm. horses and stuff like that. That's kind of the skill set that she taught herself before yeah. she started rodeoing. And so, 
you know, I was getting around that and I was really, you know, I, I liked working with horses and, um, I was kind of thinking, all right, you know, I can, uh, you know, learn from these guys and start breaking horses and start training horses and stuff like that. Like I, I really, you know, it was romantic. Yeah. But then at the same time, I grew up going all over the place. I'm like, man, you know, that's a seven day a week job. This horse has got to be fed morning and night Mm -hmm. every day. You can't leave anywhere. Yeah. You cannot leave unless you have someone basically cover all the work you need to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'll be stuck out here in the middle of nowhere, you know, as, you know, before I'm even old enough to drink, Yeah, I won't be able to go anywhere. Yeah. And like, that doesn't sound that, that fun, but I, I do, you know, like that atmosphere and the lifestyle. And then the other thing I started doing was, uh, uh, after school, like my senior year, I would just go to school half a day. And then there was a tire shop that was right next door to the school, mm-hmm. but it was like the tire shop that, you know, they did oil changes, inspections, 18 wheeler yeah, yeah. tires, tractor tires, all the service calls. We did all the tires for like the city. So mm-hmm. all, everything that, you know, uh, all their equipment that, that fixed like the dirt roads and yeah. everything we, we, we serviced. And so I started working over there and that's when I really started to like wrench a little bit and learn a little bit about mechanics and, and how that, that yeah. stuff kind of worked. And, uh, it got to where, I mean, as soon as I could, I was full time over there mm-hmm. and I just leaned more into that and I was still rodeoing a little bit, but you know, I moved, when I moved out of the house, my parents got a divorce and, uh, everything's good. We're still really close and, um, and everything's worked out as good as it could work out. Yeah. But there was a period to where, I was just getting old enough to, and I was, you know, I had my own truck and I had a part-time job and I was going to school and, uh, there was that point to where I was like, I'm ready to get out on my own. Things were weird at the, at the house, you know, things were yeah. tough. And so I, I moved out my senior year and, uh, I think it was like 17 and I, I ended up with a FEMA trailer and was parking it behind a, you know, a friend's place yeah. for 125 bucks a month Hell yeah. and, uh, working that, that tire shop job part time. And, um, you know, my mom would still pay for like my, my truck insurance and like my cell phone at the time, which was like a razor, you know? And, uh, uh, so there was that period where it's like, all right, I, I have to, to do something. And, um, you know, I tried to rodeo a little bit longer, but I, it was hard to afford that. And so it kind of forced me to like choose, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, um, so I ended up just, uh, you know, working at doing tire and loop stuff for the next like year or two. Yeah. And then I moved to Fredericksburg and I worked at the Walmart tire and loop. I worked at Walmart tire loop for three years of my life. Nice dude. Yeah. I, I think I did six months. That was, that was tough. I worked at, uh, the one there was, I, I grew up in Dallas area and there's one in Grand Prairie. Also in Grand Prairie is um, Lincoln Tech. You remember those things here? Uh-huh. Heard of that? So it's like a vocational t- style school that they teach you like HVAC, mechanics, auto body, all that shit. Yeah. And we worked at, we were the closest tire lube. <clears throat> and you know how they, they promised you to job placement with you mm-hmm. if you go to those schools? Yeah. So their promise is to get a job at Walmart. And they'll hire just about any dumbass. Yeah, they'll give them that. <laughs> but it was... This is the first time in my life I, I grew up in a shop, in a body shop, so I, I knew how to turn a wrench. You already knew all that stuff, yeah. There were certain things that were familiar to me, and when I would see somebody come from Lincoln Tech and you'd hand them a ratchet, and they literally just could not, they didn't have a, you know, there's someone that has a, a fluid motion when they use hand tools, yep. mm-hmm. right? And you could tell that they've been in their hands for a while. It's not like you're just born with it. I mean, you can, it's it's something that's familiar, right? Yeah. And I swear to God, these these kids would be, and at the same time, I'm their age, so I'm like, wow, like, you went to school for this, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm a 21-year-old kid that's just adept and, and, and mechanically inclined to where I quickly became the guy in the shop that can do every job efficiently, mm-hmm. change a tire, get a lug nut off, uh, change a battery. If you got terminals, I get drain plugs out. Like, I was the guy that got everything done. So then they started shipping me to all the other Walmarts when they would have, uh, what, basically when they wouldn't have a guy like me that can solve problems. 
never quite became a manager or anything like that, mm-hmm. but I was a problem solver in right. the shop. So it, it was, I had a street racing habit back in the day and that kind of funded that. Mm, so, yeah. but at the same time it was, uh, I don't know, it was, it was a good perspective of, of a lot of things in the shop. So it's, it's awesome that you actually went through that too. Yeah. I went there and, and I mean, f- compared to where I was working before, it was so easy it was actually a little bit too easy. Yeah. I would get too bored, but also it was just, it was, it was, uh, it was really good. Cause that, at the time when I was working at a tire and lube shop, I, I had to beg them for that job. I would go over there like once a week until they gave me a job and cleaning toilets. And I think yeah. they started me out at like $5 an hour. They started me below minimum wage. Yeah. And at that time, I think minimum wage was like six fifty or something like that. And, um, by the time I, I think I was there for like a year and a half, and uh, I left there because I, I was dating this girl in, in Fredericksburg, and I wanted to move there. And by the time I left there, I think I was making like uh, eight fifty an hour or something. And I was doing service calls and stuff. Yeah. Like I was on a truck like fixing 18-wheeler tires on the That's side wild. of the road, yeah. you know, and uh, going out to ranches. And, like, I'd go out into a field and put, like, a tractor tire on. Damn. And then i go to Walmart, and I think they started me at, like, 980 benefits after like 90 days or something yeah. like that all this stuff and then i go there and it's like all these old guys that worked there that were just complaining about everything yeah, and somebody yeah. come in you know this was before like everyone has huge rims you know yeah, yeah. but they somebody come in with like a 20 inch rim and they'd be like no we're not doing that and i'm like like three months ago i was putting on a split rim from a 1920s like <laughs> dually like yeah. worried about my head getting chopped off if this thing came loose you know yeah. what i mean and I'm just like, what the hell? Yeah, that's... And it just killed it for me. I was just like, you know, everybody's... There was so much politics within there. It was just like old people complaining all the time. Yeah. Some of the younger guys I worked with were cool. Um, and some of the some of the best people there uh, that I worked with were there for the health benefits because they had health issues and Walmart paid for that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was... One of the managers had like a heart transplant Damn. and Walmart paid for that. So he's like, I'm... I'm here for life. Like I'm not yeah. leaving. And, uh, so as far as working for Walmart, it, it yeah, was really great. Benefits, yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, they give you a discount on everything in the store, which was also a problem because lunch break, you could just walk into Walmart and get 10% off of everything. Yeah. And just, what do I feel like eating right now? Dude, I was like bad. Dude. I would walk in, go straight to the promised land, chocolate milk, the, the, <sighs> yep. the glass bottles. Mm-hmm. I just grab one and go right to the fucking tire lube. I wouldn't pay for it. Like I got, I got real bad. If you have any sort of craving at all, yeah. you literally just walk into a through a door, and yeah. it's all right there at your disposal. It's not like, oh, let me let me jump jump in the truck and go to the corner store. It's like, uh-huh. no, it's right there, and it's already the best prices, and you get a discount on top of that. Yeah. So it's like super hard. To, but anyway, I just uh, I, I got out of there uh, as soon as I could, even though it's probably one of the better jobs I've ever had as far as yeah. security goes. Um, and the potential to like move up. Move up, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's where I really started getting into wrenching. And, and I had, I had a, a bike at that time, a 2001 Yamaha R6 that I loved. One of my favorite motorcycles I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I had in a trade, cause I, I used to, I always had a diesel growing up. Um, my first truck that was given to me was a 97, uh, F250 power stroke. And then I traded that, like saved up some money and traded that. And I got a, uh, 2001, uh, Dodge Ram 3,500, like single cab dually yeah. bought from a buddy of mine. And I would hot shot in high school a little bit, make some extra money, like haul goats mm. to sale barns and different yeah. stuff. So I always had something like that, but I ended up getting this really cool truck. The only vehicle I regret selling, cause I usually don't. I don't yeah. care. I don't get too attached. But um, I ended up trading that truck straight across for a 1972 Ford F100 that someone put a 12 valve Cummins with the five speed get rag in it. And Damn. then they put the Dodge uh, Dually rear end in it and the Dodge Dually front hubs uh, onto the, the uh, F100. So it was that 72 body and then it had a skirted flatbed. Nice. Like someone had built it as like a, like kind of a showy, like oil, mm. oil rig, like welding yeah. truck, you know? And so, uh, I had that thing, but 
you know, I was always having to tinker with it, mm-hmm. but it was perfect because it was super basic and really mechanical. And so I would like go home after work and, and mess with that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I spent all the money I got, um, for graduation of high school, I spent it all on tools, like all of it. And I still use all those tools today. I still have all of them. Yeah. I bought a bunch of used like blue point stuff off of eBay and, yeah, and yeah. like, you know, cheaper stuff. I'd go to like Lowe's and get like my screwdrivers would be like, yeah, you know, cobalt well, it's and like stuff. Everybody has a lifetime warranty now. So it kind of took the, the snap on and Matco kind of a lower way a little bit, but Oh yeah. You yeah. ever heard that? I heard this younger and I've said it on the podcast many times, but, a guy told me once when I was young, he goes, if you walked in here with a craftsman tool chest and you wanted a job versus a guy that showed up with a, you know, spent some money on his tools, I'm not saying that he's better than you, but as far as reading a book by its cover, this guy looks like he invested in himself more than you have. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, like, a lot of people, especially talking to chopper guys on here, they're like, no, dude, it's all about the fucking tool. It's not about how which brand. It's like I get it. I'm I'm just making a an observation mm-hmm. that in my years coming up and working in lots of different body shops and mechanic shops and custom shops, that was the consensus. Like a lot of people, you know, they want to every every company wants to hire somebody that's going to be valuable to the team to grow, and you know sometimes it's taking a chance on this guy that yeah. you know. I mean, are, you've been doing this for 20 years and you got a fucking, you're walking in with basic hand tools, bro. Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, yeah. And also it may be a sign of like, all right, well, where are you spending that money? Oh, well you got, you, got you know, problem, two divorces but, and, yeah, and yeah. you know, you got to pay child support. So your home life isn't <laughs> that good. So, you Which, know, you're always getting in arguments with your yeah. wife or this, that, and the other, your money split a lot. of. I mean, it could be a sign for a lot of different things, but you know, to argue against some of that, like, that you're saying where people may say like, Oh, the, you know, why would you spend that much on tools or whatever? Well, a lot of these guys that have made the snap on kind of stuff popular are dudes that are working flag hours. So if you got a a really good tool and you got a a good variety of tools, you can do a job a lot faster, especially mechanic jobs, like Mm. changing out, you know, a a water pump or transmission or this, that, and the other, like, you know, if you got the right shit and you know exactly what you're doing, you can knock that stuff out fast. Yeah. Versus like if you're building a bike or you're building something else, it's like you don't you don't necessarily need all that, or if yeah. you you know what I mean. So a lot of that I think comes from efficiency. But then I am a cheap guy. Yeah. And you know I have Harbor Freight sockets that sit right beside my Matco sockets that I bought I at the same too, time yeah. seven years ago, and they're all still there. Yeah. And they're all still working fine. And one set I paid three hundred dollars for, and the other set I paid thirty dollars for. So I'm like, what yeah. are we doing here? You know what I mean? So there's that. It, and then there's that, yeah. We can get in a whole tool discussion for well, sure. My I would always tell those guys that like, well, that's also why all your Allen heads are rounded out because you don't have proper tools. Yeah. You know, that's why your Phillips heads are all rounded out because you don't know there's more than one size Phillips head. You know what I mean? Like right. there's lots of different things that come to play that you know, I, I would tell people like, there's a reason why, you know, when you buy the 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 flathead and the and the uh, and the um, Phillips head like kit, like there's three different sizes. There's three generic sizes of flat of uh, Phillips heads, right? Then of course you can get in those little watch sizes and shit like that, which you know we're not talking about that. But mm-hmm. I can't tell you how many people will try to take a battery off a motorcycle and they'll they'll always strip them out. And I'm like, yep. bro, like a lot of the cheaper can, sets will they'll skip they'll skip a, a size. Yeah. They'll do that with wrenches too. Like you'll go through there and then be like, Oh, there's not, you know, it's, it's got a, you know, a 10 millimeter and you know, or whatever. It, it doesn't matter, but they'll skip sizes. Yeah. And that's how they save on some money. Plus the fact that it, it's cheap materials. Yeah. But now you got all this, you got so much more competition in the game. Um, because you know, I mean, you know, Blue Point was Snap On, but made overseas, yeah. right? And I think is Snap On now all made overseas. I think it all is, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you know, all these other companies can go to that same factory and have the same tool made. Yeah. You know, and sometimes there might be different options. Like, all right, the bearings are better in a gear wrench that's exactly the same casing as you know. Yeah. It can break down a, a thousand different ways, but then you have like the popularity of Harbor Freight. 
and their stuff being cheap and a lot of it sucks but uh you know most of the time it'll it'll get the job done yeah and a lot of times for guys working like like ourselves that are working on our own it's like we just need this job or this tool to get this job done yeah and it'll pay for itself really quick and maybe we'll invest in something nicer later but then i think they started seeing how many mechanics were buying stuff over that uh, buying stuff from them and then they started producing better stuff now they have that whole icon line Mm -hmm. that's like competitive with with matco and cornwell i mean i have a bunch of cornwell shit and matco shit that's like totally that's broken a lot of it yeah, and same. and it's you know so you know now you can go and get like really high end tools at a, at a pretty affordable price um from Arbor Freight you know so it's like right you can go get a, a $150 wrench set from Harbor Freight that's an icon wrench set that's going to be pretty damn good yeah and you know it's going to compete against the $250 set from Snap-on and it's probably made in the same factory yeah you know it's I will I will say this about Snap On like when I when I went down the Snap On which I just paid off my Snap On account like five months ago, so I was I was you're one of the yeah. few. <laughs> it was like raising a child, you know what I mean? It uh-huh. was, I had a, a ten year run, but doing the the account stuff like doing it through that Snap On credit that shit fixed my credit. Mm. It took me from like you know my late twenties <clears throat> having really really shitty credit and not figure, not knowing what to do in life and doing that for the 10 years it just really helped kind of fix my credit plus gave me a lot of high quality tools and to the point you just made about like i have a harbor freight brake bleeder and i've had it for like six years and it's amazing and i breed i bleed brakes maybe four to five times a year right so it's like it's perfect if i was bleeding like brakes four or five times a day or a week there's no way that I would definitely have you know right. invested in a five hundred dollars yes. setup versus a thirty dollars setup. You know it, what I'm saying? It, it, a lot of that comes down to like volume. Like you're saying, if you're a dude that's working at a dealership and and you're you're changing out stuff, you know, eight hours a day every day, you know, and you need to be efficient and you need your stuff to work and and the tool guy comes to you and he repairs whatever you have and and you don't have to pay for it all up front and yeah. this and that and the other. It's like, yeah, a lot of that makes a lot of sense, you know. Um for Joe Blow, it doesn't make much sense for, you know, some guy that's just kind of doing things on his own in the garage where, you know, he's having to, like, really be budget conscious. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't know if money's coming in next week or the week after, you know. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to rack up a huge bill from Snap-on that you got to pay all the time, yeah. you know, which they is, want their which money is weekly. my case. They're like the mafia. They're showing yeah. up every week for their cut. Weekly, you know I mean? yeah. And there's guys that get upside down bad and that stuff to where – you know, and then it's hard for them to sell it. You know, oh, they yeah, they they can. ended up buying a five thousand dollar toolbox. You know, um, and you know how expensive they get. They can get crazy expensive, more than your car. Yeah. And well, they end up you know five six thousand dollars in a toolbox from Snap On, which is super easy to do. And then they're like trying to get cash and trade you for your Harbor Freight box or this and that because they're in yeah. a bind. You know, so there is you can really get stupid with that kind of yeah. stuff. You know. Yeah, I, I, I. It all turns down to the individual. Agree. What? What? Yeah. How? How can you handle it and how stuff? How can you but handle it? Yeah. I. I got. I got one Snap-on box that I bought maybe eight years ago, and it's a pretty good size one. Uh, you know, stainless top and everything. And then I have three Husky boxes that I've bought in over the last two years, mm-hmm. and the Husky bo- boxes have more amenities, and they were six hundred dollars a piece. Right, you know, like I have one that's all for camera gear, so it's all like cables, batteries, blah blah blah. I put yep. all my shit in it. Then I have one for all my airbrush and my, you know, gold leafing, pinstriping, all those things that I do there. I have a toolbox for all that, so I keep everything nice and organized. And then I have like my mechanic toolbox, which is my Snap On downstairs mm-hmm. with all the wrenches, sockets, fucking drill bits, things like that. So, and if you're not putting a ton of weight in, on yeah. them, you know, a lot of those Snap On boxes, it's like the, each drawer can hold like 400 pounds or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You know. It's like you don't you you don't always need all of that you know yeah, for certain he things. He sold me on that, yeah. right? Yeah. But I mean, if dude, I mean, go look at those. I I'm sure you have. Yeah. You go to Harbor Freight and look at those icon boxes. It's like, damn. I you pop know? off all the husky logos though, just so, yeah. Just so you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which is probably what Snap On's doing too now. I'm just throwing their logo on it, right? But yeah. uh, yeah. So with with all that being said though, man, like you know, you started going on this path, working on you know, doing the tire lube and oil tire and lube same mm-hmm. thing um after walmart what, what happens after that like 
so um uh there there was a uh i was so desperate yeah. to get out of there just you know i i had uh, uh me and that that gal at the time my high school sweetheart we had parted ways you know i'm in this town that's just kind of like a vacation town that yeah. you know retired people live at there's nothing going on i'm not old enough was to it, drink was it as booming back then as it is now in fredericksburg it was pop it's more popping now but it was yeah. i mean it it's always been from my memory like happening yeah yeah you know it's just a tourist attraction it's the closest thing you can get to and this was before all the wineries mm-hmm. it was just starting to be like yeah. wineries are getting popular when i was leaving and then now it's just like every time I go back there, I see a new winery, and, mm-hmm. and it kind of pisses me off to be honest, because it was all this beautiful land, and now it's like, oh, here's a castle, and we sell wine. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, like I've seen those, and there's like d- really dumb shit. You could tell yeah. it's designed by someone in San Not Francisco there, that yeah, yeah that's just, it. It just obtrudes out through you know the beautiful hill country, and just like in my mind, it's just it's like defecating all over the land. Like yeah. I hate it, but that's another discussion. Anyhow, but. Let that hate out, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I got lots of it. <laughs> so, uh, it, no, it was always popping, but the, uh, it's all in, you know, I've played drums since I was like 10 years old, and um, that town has always been hard on live music, too, because of no- noise ordinances and stuff. So, there was only a couple places that would have bands every so often, and they'd mm-hmm. have to be done by like 10 p.m. <laughs> There's just nothing to do there. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, especially if you're not drinking age, like I was, I think I was 19 at the time. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, I, uh, my dad ended up getting a gig running and he still does this to this day, but he, he would run all the sound at, um, these concerts at this venue in Concan, Texas, uh, called house pasture. And, um, that venue facilitated like every Texas country act you could think of, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Tanya Tucker, the Bellamy brothers, like uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Willie Nelson had played there at one time, mm-hmm. you know, there was different acts that came in like that. And, and it's located on the Frio river and it's, it's super popular vacation spot. Yeah. And so it was really like this Concan, Texas is, um, let me see, it's just a little bit North of Uvalde, like, mm-hmm. 30 miles or something and it's basically just a place that the community there is based around tourism so there's only like a hundred people that live there year round Mm -hmm. but then there could be you know thousands or uh, tens of thousands of people there throughout a weekend on in the summertime and so the summertime there was crazy so you're way out in the country in a beautiful part of the hill country you know on the frio river and you know, every night's like a party. Mm. So anyway, my dad got a gig, you know, providing the sound to that venue, doing live sound and stuff. And, um, he's like, Hey, I could use your help, you know, on the weekends as a stage hand. And, uh, you know, I'll pay you like, you know, a hundred bucks a night or something. Mm -hmm. And then, so I was like, hell yeah, anything. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, we, they, they kind of provide a little place for us to stay there. You can stay there and, you know, we'll just figure it out. And it's like, I'm in, dude. Yeah, sounds fun too. Yeah, so I, I, it, it was fun. So I, I quit my job, uh, moved down there. I was living in a little room, uh, still there. It's a stage side at at uh, house pasture there, and so I started helping my dad. And then um, they would do like Wednesday night karaoke. I turned into like a karaoke DJ. Like they would oh, pay did? me like 150 bucks to do that. <laughs> Never sang karaoke in my life. Still haven't. Um, hate it by the way (laughs) but i would i would uh run the was a uh, karaoke dj would help my dad on the stage and then uh i met a good friend of mine there and we started playing music together and you know it was just fun learn how to drink there i I didn't drink there was when i when i grew up like there was no smoking there was no drinking you know yeah no beer in the fridge at the house that my dad drank nothing like that i wasn't around it at all and i grew up in a Grew up in a dry county, so there was no bars. Uh, There's no liquor. You could just buy beer at the gas station kind yeah. of a thing. And so, um, you know, all of a sudden I'm at a party spot. And, uh, you know, so that was like the first time I smoked weed, like the first time I had sex, like the first time, you know, it was my first for everything. Like rum springer for you. <laughs> yeah. But I'm like 19, 20, you yeah. know what I mean? It's like, I, so I, I learned all of that there and then uh, started playing with my buddy, and uh, we, we formed a little band called the uh, River Road Show. 
and then that morphed into uh, the Drop Tines, which is still a band now. I recently quit that to move here and take this job. But anyhow, uh, you know, that's Spotify, the Drop Tines. Check it out. Like, all that music that's recorded there, like, I drummed on. Nice. Um, so anyhow, uh, we, we were doing all that stuff, but then the off season would come around and it was crazy. It would be like one weekend, it's like a party, you're, uh, you know, all this stuff's going on every night. Like you're hanging out with the band all the time. Uh, you know, or that's the other thing is like, I would help my dad and then the venues started paying me to be the runner for the band. So I would help my dad set up and do all that stuff, and then I would just facilitate the band. I would make sure that they had their beers, that, like, everything on their rider was done. Yeah. Like, when the bus pulled up at 8 a.m., like, I talked to the bus driver and made sure he knew where to park, plug the bus in. And then as soon as those guys would wake up around noon or, or 1 p.m., uh, uh, hey, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to float the river? I'll take you there. Do you want to go do this? you want to go do that? you want to go play golf? I'll take you to the golf yeah. course. All this different stuff. Um. And, and the bands that would come to there knew of that place, and so they would always want to do stuff. They would be like, nice. yeah, we want to play golf. We want to float the river. We want to do this. We want to do that. So, you know, I'm getting to hang out with all these really popular, you know, bands like Turnpike Troubadours or, like, Josh Abbott or Randy Rogers, like, all those guys. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's super fun. And then the off season comes around, and all of a sudden, everybody's there one week, and the next week, and no one's there. Mm. Super lonely. Like, there's no chicks. There's yeah. no nothing. I'm still not really old enough to drink, so I can't, like, just go to the bars or anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, pretty much everything shuts down. Yeah. And then also, I'm out of work because there's no concerts anymore. So, uh, but the, there was a golf course there, and, you know, it went year-round. And so I started, like, cleaning golf carts. I was like a cart boy. Mm. And uh, was doing that, and... um Anyhow, I, I did that for like two summer. I, I stayed there for like a year and a half or so. And um, anyway, I at one point I went to Guitar Center in San Antonio to get some stuff for my my drum set, and uh, wasn't really playing with my buddy. He just got out of high school, and he ended up uh, hitting the road, uh, hitchhiking. Nice. Cause we, we picked up some hitchhikers, brought them the con can. We had these shacks out in the woods. We called the sheds and we used to party in them like mm -hmm. hardcore because we were all underage. So it's like, we go out in the woods and like drink beer and smoke weed and stuff out there. Yeah. And, uh, so we pick up these hitchhikers one day, we bring them in. Sorry, by the way, that I'm all over the place, no, but fine. there's, there's a lot of shit going on. So pick up these hitchhikers one day and they're just like traveling, playing music, busking and stuff. And, my buddy, uh, Connor that I started that band with is like infatuated and it's the off season. Things are slowing down. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like working at the golf course sucks. You know, I'm making minimum wage or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, he's like, dude, I'm going to go hitchhiking. He's like, I want you to go with me. Like we're best friends. And I was like, hell no, dude. Like, you know, I was living in a FEMA trailer. Now I'm living in the shack. Like, it, like, it was super cool time of my life, but I didn't like it at the time. Now I look yeah. back on it, and I'm like, dude, that was cool as shit. Easy. I should have enjoyed yeah. it more. I was always trying to get, like, what's the next best thing I can get? Like, yeah. I'm tired of living in a, in a horse trailer or a FEMA trailer or a, you know, single wide that's falling apart or, at that point, uh, a shed in the woods with no yeah. plumbing. Like, uh, I was like, hell no, dude. Like, I'm trying to move up, you know? And... Uh, so anyhow, he pieces out and goes hitchhiking and, uh, you know, I'm like, shoot, what am I going to do? And anyway, I was at Guitar Center in San Antonio buying some stuff for my drum set and I was, uh, uh, met this guy that had a property there in Concan and he had race horses and he was retired and he would want to go with his girlfriend to Costa Rica and stuff. So he's like, you can stay in my house. I'll, I'll give you a room, you know, feed the horses and all this different stuff and exercise them. So I was like breezing race horses and stuff, mm. which was really fun. And taking the thoroughbreds to the racetrack in San Antonio, letting the jockeys exercise them like proper on the track and stuff yeah. coming out of the gates. So that was cool. And that, that kind of like kept me, you know, my head above water yeah. flow at the time. And, uh, I would just like set up my drums in the living room there while he was gone and like play and keep, keep sharp, you know? Mm -hmm. So I see this ad for a band at, at like guitar center in San Antonio. And it 
it had, you know, a list of bands that were their influence that was like Mars Volta and Circus Survive and oh, this yeah. and that and the other. And I was like, oh shit, this is cool. And it had like the tag where you take the number. Yeah. So I pulled the number and I hit these guys up. And like a week later, I come in for an audition and it's like on the south side of San Antonio in this back house and like super Mexican neighborhood. Mm. And uh, anyway, that's where the band Danilo Drive got formed and they're, st- they're still going today. And shoot, I think they've, it's almost 10 years now. It's just crazy. It's gone by so fast. So that's another band you can look up um, on Spotify. So they got like a Mars Volta vibe to them? Yeah, definitely. Nice, nice. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. Saw them um, live once. It was, a, oh, it was amazing. Oh, dude. In a small I, place. So awesome, man. Yeah. Uh, so actually, one of uh, a co-worker here, uh, Alec Patron, and I've, um, uh, not Patron, Patron, I uh, interviewed him on my podcast, Colt Wrangler Radio. He's the guy that brought me in to hear at Revival. I know we're skipping ahead a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. But um, he plays in a band uh, called um, The Trail of the Trail of Dead, for short, I think it's like, and they will know us by The Trail of Dead. I think mm-hmm. this is the full name of the band. Anyway, they have a big underground following, and he got to play with At The Drive-In. Oh, they nice. went on tour with them at That's one point. Yeah, yeah, super dope. I thought that At The Drive-In was trying to make a comeback at some point. Get another one of those down there. Right. Do what? Throw me another of those oh, beers. Yeah. Um, they're all over there, but I'm not yeah. sure, but I... I I want to say maybe they did like a reunion tour. Yeah, or something. maybe it would just been a reunion tour. Seeing if they they you know, no, I love I love both of them. I, at the drive is a little more, a little more brash than I like that. Right, but, uh, Mars Volta is very much more proggy and and Mars Volta is like, in my opinion, it's a Pink Floyd and uh, and a Zeppelin kind of come together kind mm-hmm. of vibe. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. It, that might be a bad analogy, but that's just what I take of it. Yeah, that makes sense. yeah, yeah. I I hear you there. So anyway, um, I start rehearsing with this band and, uh, and you know, it's the off season. I don't know what I'm going to do for a job. And my godfather calls me and he, he lives in my hometown. He, uh, sorry, man, these beers are making me burp. (laughs) Modelo, dude. Uh, anyway, my, my, my godfather, he's, uh, you know, uh, team roper and whatnot, but he, uh, was in the oil field for a long time and then started pro- noticing that there was only like one or two suppliers providing a certain part needed for fracking. Mm-hmm. And so he started the business building these parts. And, um, and, and that was in my hometown where I grew up and he calls me. He's like, Hey, you need a job. You know how the oil field yeah. is, is t- upticks. Uptown, and all yeah. of a sudden he's needing to like, he's gets thousands of these orders for this part and he needs people to help him build it. And, um, uh, I was like, uh, you know, eh, I did need a job. I was like, ah, no, I don't really. Let me think about it. Let me think about it. And then <laughs> that guy where I was living at his house, he calls me one day out of the blue. He's like, hey, my daughter's moving back in. I need you to go, like, within two days. I'm damn. like, damn. All right. Yeah, that's the universe telling you what's Yeah. Going. So I, I was like, I don't have anything to do. I don't have any money. I don't have any money saved up. So I was like, I took that job. So I moved back to my hometown and my godfather said, I need you for six months, at least six months. That's, you got to commit that to me. Sure enough. All right, I'll do it. But the great thing about that was it was all metal fabrication. Mm. And that's where the first time I ever welded anything was. I started having the welders show me. It was all MIG welding, you know, and, and they had big battleship lays there where they would turn down these tools. They called them tools and I'm not exactly sure how that works on the, on the fracking side. Yeah. But we made these parts. And so then all of a sudden, uh, I'm around, uh, you know, metal fabrication all day. And then I'm driving to San Antonio at least once a week to go yeah. practice with this band. Cause I joined that band. And, um, anyhow, I worked for six months, you know, kind of learned a little bit how to MIG weld. And then, uh, as soon as that was done, Shook hands with my godfather, moved to San Antonio to play with this band. Yeah. I was like, I'll figure it out. I'll find a job. And I start looking on Craigslist for a job. And uh, I see that they need carriage drivers for driving downtown. (laughs) I was like, I've never driven a carriage, but pretty handy with a horse. So I go there for a job interview and I I get the job. So I started driving those carriages downtown. Did you wear a suit? (laughs) Like a... a 
Like out proper suitor. I cowboyed you? out. Oh, you did. I nice. thought that would help me. It really didn't make a fucking okay. difference, to be honest. It was just like, you know, Cinderella carriages and all this different stuff. Yeah, Nobody yeah. gave a shit what you looked like. I thought, man, if I dress cowboyed up, like I'm tall top boots tucked in, like wild rag vest, yeah. sharp cowboy hat, people are gonna pick me. It didn't really go that way. I mean, they, you know, they would just basically walk up and, yeah, how much? You know, give us a ride, and so. You know, I started getting familiar with downtown. I had to learn a, a little bit of the history. And so I would be uh, doing those carriage rides. And that was the first time I ever lived in a city that was bigger than Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg yeah. at the time was like 14,000 people or something. So now all of a sudden I'm in San Antonio, there's millions of people. Yeah. It's like the seventh largest city in the U.S. It's, yeah. People don't realize how big that place is. So anyhow, I'm down there playing in like a hard rock band. So I remember there was times I would literally like leave the horse barn you know uh you know clean the stall feed the horse you know wash them do all that stuff put the carriage away and then like walk over to my little volkswagen i was driving at the time and like flyer downtown with band posters and i'd be like in a cowboy hat with a wild rag and my boots tucked in and stuff putting up like you know this crazy looking like artwork and shit for yeah. a metal show you know <laughs> on different walls yeah and um Anyway, that that uh, uh, besides well, Walmart and and this job, no, this job was definitely had the the weirdest coworkers okay. I've, I've I've ever been around. Was people that drive carriages downtown. It was like really odd. The owners of that business were super odd. I mean, I got the crazy stories and just just weird. And then also like our barns were underneath the like close to the overpasses that. Um, you know, go around downtown. So mm -hmm. it's like all homeless people underneath the oh, overpasses yeah, yeah. and stuff. So it was just, it, it's, it was, well, also there was the, uh, uh, church under the bridge, I think. Yeah. And, I that. Yeah. And so they were like right there, mm -hmm. right by our barn. And they, they would, uh, uh, feed the homeless there. I don't, I want, not every day, but like every couple of days or something. Yeah. So they were always really close by, you know, and there were some other shelters. So you would see the wildest shit. Like, you know, I've seen dead people too. It's like, you know, somebody that overdosed and they're yeah. just like baking under the bridge dead. And I'm like pulling out in a carriage. Like I'm from the 1800s. It's like, just like weird. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was a good experience. And then I, you know, I rented the cheapest place I could find not knowing anything about the city. And I ended up like in the, the East side, which is one of the roughest neighborhoods in San Antonio, uh, kind of close to the AT&T center and, uh, you know, it's all black neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know? And so that was cool. That was a good experience. I needed that to be honest. Um, you know, it was sketchy as hell. You hear gunshots all the time. You know, first time my car had ever been broken into mm -hmm. first time I'd ever seen somebody like, you know, flash a gun at me. Yeah. Like in that way, you know, just like real hood shit, uh, you know, having to go to the laundromat and different stuff like that. Like yeah, I didn't yeah. grow up like that. So that was a good eye opening experience. Um, and then, you know, that carriage job was like, man, this sucks. Like, and also it was all commission. You just got to commit a cut off of how yeah, many whatever. rides you did. So it was super inconsistent. So, uh, I ended up, I was, I had a little project bike I was working on at the time. It's like my first project bike and it was a 72 like CB 550 mm -hmm. that someone had built into a cafe racer and they hadn't quite finished it out. Like it was rideable, but it still needs some work, needs some paint, this, that, and the other. Yeah. So I was like working on that thing and I had my tools and stuff and I was living in a little garage, one bedroom garage apartment, um, on the east side. And uh, on the weekends, I'd just ride around, and I was riding downtown, and I stopped um, in South Town at this bar, and this guy came out to look at the bike. I had it looking pretty good at that point, and uh, was like, man, this thing's cool. Like, um, hey, I work at this shop. Like, do you uh, – we, we actually need, like, a tech right now. We put lift kits on and stuff. It's like a four-wheel drive truck uh, – four-wheel drive shop. Mm -hmm. It's like all trucks and stuff. And that shop's called Maximum Altitude in San Antonio. And um, I was like, heck yeah, I was looking for anything else. Yeah. And uh, so I went over there, had a job interview. They hired me. I don't know. what, Like, I really didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's where I really started wrenching. You know, I started tearing suspension apart and putting these lift kits and stuff back on. 
and um, you know, is there a lot of welding involved with that at all, or is it more? It's like all bolt on, bolt on stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had you know there was some years there where they had some fabricators and they were building these really crazy like super jacked up like you know yeah, yeah. magazine cover trucks and stuff. And that uh, one of the guys that was one of their fabricators for a long time was there for a few months before um, was there for a few months and then had quit. Or I'm sorry, he quit a few months after I had started. Okay. And and I was so busy doing everything else, I didn't really get to learn much from him. And he had been there for like 10 years or whatever. And uh, anyhow, um, you know, I started doing all that, and uh, that job actually sucked. But <laughs> it, it, was a, uh, it was good for me um, to, you know, to learn. Um, looking back on it, it's like, wow, I can't believe, like, they let me, like, do that stuff, like, without yeah. supervision at times. Like, there was some stuff, like, that I did that <laughs> I just so, I cringe at, yeah. you know, uh, looking back. But, you know, I was really thankful for the opportunity, and that that was a big step forward. And um, so that job, it was just, I'm not into, like, that's when the big rim stuff started getting huge yeah. in the in the four wheel drive trucks and the Cali lean kind of stuff and I'm just like I'm just not into that. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, anyhow, I was looking to I wasn't getting paid that much anyway. I didn't have any health benefits and I was looking for something else. And I was dropping some parts off at like the place where we would uh, drop our powder coating off at, and I see this like cool hot rod shop. And I'm like, dude, I got to go by there. And it's yeah. all like, you know, chopped Mercs and, and you know, slammed El Caminos and stuff nice. like that. And I'm like, dude, this is rad. I walk up to the shop and there's a pit bull on the end of the chain. You know, this dude comes out and he's just like dirty as hell, like fully tattooed up. You know, this guy's name was Billy, like smoking a cigar. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it's like lace paint and all this stuff. I'm like, nice. dude, this is rad. So I start talking to him. And uh, I was like, man, you need anybody? You need some help? And he's like, yeah, I could use a little help, you know. I'll come back here, like, next week or whatever. Bring me a resume. All right, cool. So I started, like, pushing to get that job. And then, uh, you know, we kind of had a handshake deal, and I quit my other job and went over there. Uh, that It was, uh, I think it was called Bear County Hot Rods or something mm-hmm. like that. Man, I didn't, I didn't know the industry. Like, I, I couldn't tell the signs at that time. Now I could have walked into that shop and been like, oh, yeah the, the, yeah these cars come in here and don't leave yeah. you know cars come in here they get torn apart and they don't leave yeah. but it was so cool it was like social distortion playing you know lone star in the fridge like the toilet was like pinstriped and yeah, like yeah. my first day on the job they were doing like a photo shoot in there with like this pinup girl in like a lincoln continental and that they were you know that he was putting an airbag system in and different stuff and uh so, uh, but that shop was one of those shops where, you know, he was having, uh, uh, Rob Peter to pay Paul yeah. and, you know, I'm supposed to be getting like 500 a week and like my first paycheck is like 250 mm. and, you know, he just didn't have any money. And yeah. so I, I think I, I was able to like hang on there for like a month or so. And at that time I had bought this little project Sportster and, um, he was kind of, you know, he had the welder there and everything was MIG weld in. Like there wasn't no ticket. Yeah. There was no precise anything. Yeah. And, uh, so I started just getting more around fabrication and at the end of the day, I'd pull my bike in, you know, and, and we'd work on it there. Was he doing a lot of, uh, were they doing any like panel replacement or were they notching frames, things like that in there? Or was it yeah, like basic? Like that, know? but not well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> not, not good. It wasn't good, but I mean, it was kind of like that true hot rider vibe where it's yeah. just, you know, rough and, and, you mm, know, makes sense. Right. But, uh, yeah, they were doing it, but you know, not at the level that it should, like the cars we were chopping yeah. on. It's like, we shouldn't have been chopping on in my opinion, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I'm thankful for like these, I know it's like, I don't want to like bad mouth these places that much. Um, but if you said you were going to take your car there, I would say, no, do that, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. but, but I, Hey, I didn't have any experience and I, I am thankful for those opportunities because they were steps, steps they up. They give you a perspective of like people that run shops poorly versus, you know, better. And oh yeah. 
you know, you, you start to learn a lot more, like you said at the beginning of that whole uh, concept of how these, you should have saw the signs, like they were written on the wall, like mm-hmm. you just, and you know those now. And so when you, know you know, now. you're in a fucking amazing spot now that I'm sure has their shit together because mm-hmm. you just don't have a nice spot like this with nice shit in it and you don't have your shit together. You know what yeah. I mean? So, yeah, that makes sense. No, that's true. And, um, you know, so I started working there and I, and I learned a lot, man. I learned a lot at that place and, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm thinking of max. I really learned a lot at maximum altitude. And then at Billy's, I didn't learn that much, but I got to be around an atmosphere that I liked a little bit, but I was like, I want to work on cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to really get in the customizing. I don't want to just put a rough country kit on this guy's two wheel drive truck to make it look like it's a full wheel drive, yeah, you know, with some glow lights underneath it or whatever. I'm like, this, yeah. is, this is stupid. Like, I don't, you know, and um, so that was my first step into like truly like the custom world. And um, anyway, you know, I wasn't getting paid basically, yeah. Uh, you know, and so I had to just quit. I just tell him like, dude, I can't be here. I gotta go. Yeah, like, you know, so I left there. And, um, man. How, was there, uh, are there no like bike shops predominantly down there to where you could oh. have kind of worked into any of those or there was a bike shop next door yeah. actually. Um, I'm Bins trying to remember the name of it. Do what? Bins and bikes. Oh yeah. That's, that's the other thing. I think that was the next thing. It wasn't bins and bikes, Okay, but, uh, Chuck that owns bins and bikes, uh, was, uh, longtime friends with Joey who owned, um, uh, maximum altitude. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we did, uh, we did Chuck's truck at maximum altitude, which was like, at that time it was like a 2017 Dodge Dooley full wheel drive, you know, it was brand new. And we put like 24s on it and lifted it and did that whole deal for Chuck. And so, uh, and then my boss had a bagger, had a custom bagger. And then, uh, he got that done by Chuck. Like they would just trade. Yeah. We would work on Chuck's truck and customize some of his stuff. And then my boss at Max Mountain Joey would get his bike built by Benz and bikes. Yeah. So I started going over there and then I made a relationship with those guys and I started working over there on Saturdays. Mm. And then I quit working with maximum altitude was at this hot rod shop. And then on my Saturdays, I would go over to Benz and bikes mm. and, uh, you know, and then when I had to leave, uh, the hot rod shop because I wasn't getting paid. Um, uh, Chuck was like, "Hey man, well they were paying me like a hundred dollars a day, which was like big money to me at the time. Yeah. I was like, Holy shit, you know." And uh, I was just like cleaning toilets and organizing parts, and you know I would just be annoying and ask as many questions as I could. And I was yeah. riding a Harley. I was kind of like customizing at the time. And he's like, "Man, I think I can use you over here, like you know, at least three days a week." And it was like enough for me to survive. You know, yeah, that's cool. Because I'm, I'm renting a room. I'm paying like $300 for a room at that time. And anyhow, so I started working over there and uh, never really got to work on anything, but was kind of learning, was bothering the techs a lot, was working on my own bike there, and was getting into the fabrication stuff a little bit more. Yeah, because they used to cut necks a lot and, and like do a little bit of fabrication on some of the frames and stuff there, mm-hmm. from what I remember. They did. It wasn't in house though. Oh, it was. But they had they had like stuff there. You know, they would go and uh, Chuck would like find deals at auctions and stuff. And so, uh, you know, they would probably have their own welder there and stuff that was nice. But there was no welder yeah. in the shop. And they would get oh um, man I, I'm uh uh forgetting his name, but he has a bare bones garage in San Antonio. Sure. And he does a lot of hot, you know hot rod building and stuff. And he, I think he would come, and if I remember right, weld the necks and stuff, yeah, uh, and change the rake for those baggers. And um, he does a lot of stuff. And if I'm not, hopefully I'm not confusing guys, but he does a lot of stuff with like Sosa now. He okay. does the metal shaping classes, and they always host them at his shop now oh, that's cool. in San Antonio. So anyway, yeah, I, I started going there, and then it got to where, like, you know, I was working at Benz and Bikes three or four days a week, and that was, like, my only source of income, still playing in that band. And then that was the one and only job I've ever been fired from. For real? Yeah, and I wasn't really told a reason. And um, now I look back, and, uh, 
it, it's funny because like Chuck and I have uh, uh, a, a good relationship now and I was actually going to rent some space from him a couple years ago when I was looking to move shops. But um, anyway, there's there's a lot of layers to that onion and the reasons why I potentially think that I was let go. But, you know, everything was like a handshake deal. It was cash, yeah, like yeah. this and that and the other. And I wasn't, I was getting to learn. I was getting to be around it, but I still wasn't working on pikes. I still wasn't really getting to do anything. Yeah. And um, so anyway, from there, you know, from meeting people in the truck scene, uh, I got offered, you know, a position at this other truck shop, which ended up being like uh, this shop that kind of blew up. It, it blew up and it burned out quick. It was called Cash Bread Customs. And, uh, or Cash Bread Off-Road. And I was the only guy working there at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just putting on lift kits. We didn't even have a lift at that point, but I was putting on lift kits on the ground like every day. I was mm -hmm. doing like at least one, I was doing like one lift kit in, you know, one to two days on the ground. And um, and then, you know, he, he had some friends that were getting into the Ultra 4 racing and the guy that drove that was a fabricator. And so I just, you know, you start growing your web and you yeah, start yeah, getting around a yeah. little bit more people that know a little bit more what they're doing and a little bit more and a little bit higher budget kind of stuff. And then, so at that point I started getting pretty decent at wrenching on stuff and, um, um, uh, not too much fabrication, but started doing a little bit. And, uh, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Robert Cheek, he um and i know Good he one. yeah robert and he loves his podcast he's one of the guys that actually really broke down like welding for me for yeah. the first time MIG he, welding he welds yeah that's right he is a welder that's mm -hmm. right. yeah he did uh he used to teach welding at the school he does like the pipe fitting yeah, stuff yeah. and uh, it's all mig welding stuff so he he started teaching me how to weld um i'm trying to remember this timeline i've never broke it down this in depth yeah, so yeah. i know i'm rattling on it's almost more for myself at this point. Yeah. But um, anyway, I started working for Cash Bread Off Road, doing bike stuff. At that, by that time, that same sports store I had started looking pretty good, and um, I rode it to the handbuilt show in like 2015, mm -hmm. and got some attention for it in like the parking lot, and then got invited to this after party by some. Uh, some people I could had connected with uh, through Instagram that run the site Cafe Races of Instagram, mm -hmm. and um, they they were doing a tour where they were going through the U.S. on like CB seven fifties, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so well, David, you, you, yeah, da David and um, they were talking about it. they were just on the podcast. That's right. A couple weeks ago. I listened. Yeah. To, yeah, it's funny because I. Uh, uh, like when that podcast came out, David was actually in Austin and we went and had dinner and, yeah, yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, so, uh, David and, uh, Andrew and they were, they were touring on those CB 750s. Was this when they did that, the tour on like where they left in the winter? Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Okay. That and makes sense. They had actually connected with one of the guys I worked with at, uh, Bins and Bikes and they hit him up because they were coming through like San Antonio area and they were having some problems mm. and they just needed like a shop. And uh, the, the guy that they hit up at the time wasn't there and he gave them my number and I had keys to the shop that I was working at, at Cash Bread Off Road. Mm -hmm. And I was working on my bike there and had all my tools there and everything there. And so, uh, you know, they came by the shop one evening and like we just spent the evening like working on their bikes and getting them yeah. getting them back on the road. Did you still have the the CB at the time too? I didn't. I had a I had a, a Harley Sportster that I turned into a cafe racer, nice. and I had like cut the back end of a Sportster tank off to make like a cafe cow for the seat, oh, yeah, and yeah. like just you know uh, couldn't afford paint, so I like polished all the metal, all the steel to make it look shiny yeah, because. Yeah. The whole bike was like, it was one of the Sportster like customs to where it came with all the chrome. Yeah. And I couldn't afford to like, that was when chrome was not cool at all. And, uh, I couldn't afford to like powder coat or no. do anything. So I was just like, how do I make it look clean? So I was like, I'll just polish everything. I'll make it all like chrome. Yeah. Right. And at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of like, people weren't like cafe and Harleys really. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm going to bike shit. Yeah. It was yeah. like probably around that time. Uh, you know, Roland Sands was like doing some stuff. Yeah, cause I had a cafe. I had I had a twelve hundred Nightster, my first Harley I ever had, and uh, Roland had just. This was two thousand seven eight ish, 
and he just started coming out with like the clip on setup and right, all those yeah. and a couple different things to kind of turn a sporty into something kind of more mm-hmm. cafe style. Yeah, and I went down that road because I come from sport bikes as well. Like I did all the sport bike shit in the early two thousands, and then I kind of chased money into Harley's and then fell in love with Harley's. If that right. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I. I. Uh, yeah. My progression into like getting into like a cafe bike or Harley was is kind of interesting as well because my first bike was an R six and then I got an R one and then you know yeah. I, I loved that. But um. Anyway, yeah. I I I, I met uh, met David and Andrew through that through that and. You know, they were kind of on the schedule and, but, you know, we got to spend the evening together meeting each other, yeah. um, wrenching on their bike, getting them down the road. And that's turned into like yeah, such a great friendship. And, uh, anyhow, they, when I was at the handbelt show that year, uh, David was like, oh dude, we're, there's this, uh, a bunch of us from all over in the, in the industry have like rented this Airbnb outside of Austin. That's on this like little ranch Mm -hmm. and we're having a big after party there. Like we'd like you to come. And I was sick as a dog, you know, but I was like, it's a good opportunity. I got to go, man. I don't really know many people. I'm like starting to build stuff and you know, I got to be there. And so I had actually put my, uh, sportster in the van I was driving cause I was in a band, you know, so we needed the van and I drove it to the handbell show because I felt so shitty and then got invited to that after party and drove it over there and unloaded it from the van. And I met David Paul Michaels, who at the time was running, um, uh, shoot. It's one of the, it's, it's, uh, it's like lowbrow customs, but for like cafe racers, okay. Dime City Cycles. Oh yeah. yeah. I know that. Yeah. So, uh, he was right. He was like part owner in Dime City Cycles at the time and he was really well connected. So I ended up meeting him at that party and, uh, David and Andrew was talking about my bike, said, dude, pull it out. So I pulled my bike out of the van and they're like, oh shit. And this party was all like photographers, like influencers, like in the motorcycle yeah. industry, um, you know, uh, all kinds of people, but everyone was and a, a lot of my, I, I still keep up with to this day. Um, e- uh, even, uh, I met junior Burrell there who taught me actually how to shape metal. Mm. I met him at that party. So, but didn't, didn't learn from him until year, years later. But anyway, that, that was a pivotal point. Um, you know, I was working at this other shop, putting on lift kits. I wanted to, to get more into building doing bike stuff. I was basically, you know, uh, you know, built this bike as much as I could actually build it, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and was just really, I just wanted to, to make something cool. Anyway, Jason Paul Michaels sees it and it's like, dude, are you staying here tonight? I was like, yeah, I'm going to crash in the van. He's like, I got the photographer here. I want you to, uh, stick around and tomorrow we're going to shoot photos of this. I write articles for Iron and Air magazine and would love to feature this build. Nice. I was like, there it is. So anyway, the next day, um, one of the photographers, uh, Matthew, man, I'm forgetting his name. Anyway, he shoots a lot of stuff for like Lincoln mm-hmm. and like a lot of car stuff now. Um, amazing photographer. They sh- picture perfect, like hill, Texas Hill Country in the background, yeah. like out in the field, take shots of this bike. And, uh, it just kind of grew from there. And then he hooked me up. I basically ended up not too long after that saying, screw it. Like, let me just work on other people's bikes because, Mm -hmm. you know, I started doing stuff for myself. People were asking me to do stuff for them. And I said, you know, you know, I'm already broke. (laughs) Yeah. I'm already barely getting by. I might as well barely get by and get to do something I like to do. And, continue to build your skill set on it too yeah. exactly and that's the best way to build your skill set is just to dive in mm-hmm. and basically put yourself in a pressure situation where it's do or die yeah. you either build this shit you weld it you build this guy or or you don't eat yeah you know and you're never gonna learn a better way than that way because it's like you have to do it you can't rely on anybody else like you got to do it and you got to make it happen and you got to do it good enough to make the next guy see that bike and want to come back to you or this yeah. guy come back to you and have you do more. So anyway, it, it, it grew from that point And, um, I ended up, I was trying to find a shop. I, you know, couldn't really afford anything. 
and I would just drive around every day after work and and look for places and call and I started snooping around and uh, found this really cool building in Southtown that was like in kind of in rough shape um, and I started like looking over the fence and this and that and uh, this guy like saw me looking around and came in and he's like hey okay, man like what are you what are you doing I was like actually I'm I, uh, I'm looking for a shop space. Like I'm just getting into like building motorcycles and he was building some like land cruiser in his backyard or whatever. And so yeah. we hit it off and, and he did like architectural fabrication and stuff. And he's like, man, I actually have some friends. Like at first he's like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. And then once we started talking, he's like, man, I got a friend that's got this shop space, like a few streets over. And, uh, he, it, 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 he'd probably rent it to you pretty cheap. And, uh, it was all, it was this place that used to be called the Wiggle Room in San Antonio. Sounds cool. <laughs> it, well, yeah. It, well, it was like, it was like just a DIY, like punk yeah. rock venue. Oh, nice. But it turned into a trap house, basically. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was like started as a cool punk rock artsy kind of thing. And then it, it ended up being a bunch of people that were just shooting up heroin at the end of the day. Mm. And that were just living in there. And so they had like, basically got everybody evicted out of there. It was this cool old building that used to be a hardware store just south of downtown in Southtown. And uh, uh, like pretty much right across from where Freetail Brewery is now. And um, anyway, this building was just like falling down. And there was like cr like crazy... Like, there was a lot of art and stuff, and there was a lot of, like, graffiti and stuff that was cool there. And then you could see to where the progression, where it started getting dark, mm. where it was, like, really, like, dark art with, like, demon faces on the wall with, like, upside-down crosses and stuff between their eyes. And, like, yeah. you could literally see the progression. And then it got to where I, I had to clean this place out. I made a deal with these people. I said, give me six months free, and I'll clean it up. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'm going to pay, like, $300 a month. And utilities and they were just so desperate you know it was like a couple and one one was uh working at the airport and then the wife was taking care of the kids and they had this property and they didn't want to get rid of it and you know things spiraled out of the control with the people that were there and uh they just needed help yeah and i needed a place that i could get for basically nothing and i was ready to work and uh so anyway i started cleaning that place up and I just found the craziest shit there. You know, there was people that started, like, taking, like, things apart and making artwork from taking apart, like, cameras and different stuff. But it was, like, dark. Yeah. And uh, it was really sketchy, man. And that, that building was starting to fall in. And so it was a really cool brick building, but I it was starting to get, like, moldy. I couldn't use it. And the owners couldn't afford to, like, fix the roof. But at some point, someone had built, like, a metal building off the side of it. Mm -hmm. and was using it as to do like carpentry work mm -hmm. and it, it didn't have any electricity but you could pull electricity from the main the main building and in the main building there was some plumbing and there was actually a bathroom in there uh with with an old school tub and a toilet and there was a hot water heater and they had built a platform above it that or they had built a room and there was a hot water heater on top of that mm -hmm. room but the roof above it was caving in and uh but yeah, I had to put some support beams up so that the wood, when it was rotting, wouldn't fall in on, and I wouldn't have a hot water heater fall on top of me while I was in the shower. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I mean, there were so many times, and it was kind of cool, man. I, I mean, like, if you're young and you're you're in a rough spot, take some time to like really cherish it because you're gonna look back really fondly on those days. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So I, I there were so many showers where I would I would take a shower in there, and it would be raining cold water from the roof down through the roof of the bathroom onto me mixed with the hot water that I was getting from the shower. <laughs> and it was, and there's cockroaches everywhere. And, yeah. uh, you know, I had to get over the demon faces and different stuff that I would see when I would walk into that room and it's completely dark and you're on, you you're know, not like sketch you out at all. Like, oh, it sketched me out a lot, but okay. what am I going to do? Like I want to shower. I need electricity to pull from there. I need water, you know, different stuff. Yeah. And I just got, I basically my mentality going into it, and this goes back to my mother being a, 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 a preacher and the things that she taught me is like, hey, like basically how I would interpret it now is my good vibes are going to trump the bad shit that's in here. Okay. Yeah. And that's the attitude I took into there. I was like, you know, what? I'm not going to be scared by this. 
you know, because my mom was like, don't be scared of the devil. You know, it's, if you get bad thoughts, that's the devil's thoughts. Those aren't your yeah. thoughts. You know, it was all like positive thinking and and uh, um, all that kind of stuff, like real evangelical Christian yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, that's also real close to just kind of like hippie shit, you know. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I just had that good mindset going in. It's like, you know what, like this stuff's scary, but like I'm, I'm, I, I know that uh, what I'm packing is, is better. Mm-hmm. And so eventually I changed the atmosphere of that place and started bringing positive light to it and uh, kind of had to get over those, that stuff. And I ended up having a camp. I bought this little camper, 17-foot camper trailer for like 1500 bucks, and I could pull it with my van, and I was able to pull it back there in the yard space plug it into electricity, run a water hose to it. And then I could, if I wanted hot water in a shower, I could go into yeah. the, the falling down building. And then I had my workshop set up in the uh, metal part of the building and I, and I fixed it up and I, you know, started doing whatever I could do. And I started getting attention from like local media and stuff. I ended up being in like the San Antonio magazine and um, I was just putting an Instagram out there. I was trying to connect with every like, you know, uh, anybody that was doing anything. And, uh, I started making connections in the kind of the fashion, uh, crafts and fashion and like leather goods kind of world, mm-hmm. uh, in San Antonio. And I ended up meeting the guys at bear goods that make like leather goods and stuff. Uh, and they commissioned, uh, the first bike build I ever did. Mm. And, um, so, I built that bike there and, and things just progressed. Jason Paul Michaels, again, that had written that article about me in iron and air calls me one day and is like, Hey man, would you want to do like a TV show? AMC is doing this travel motorcycle show with Norman Reedus Mm -hmm. and they're looking for like really underground spots that nobody knows about, blah, 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 blah. They need to go to San Antonio and see the Alamo. It's for like their Texas episode. Yeah. You fit the bill. Perfect. You used to rodeo, blah, blah. And so that was kind of like my second break. So ended up being on the episode. It was like five minutes at the end of an episode where Norman Reedus came to my shop, and that yeah. was the shop did that I was talking whole, about. Did he do the whole Texas thing in one episode? Because I know he was in Dallas, too, or it might have been a different season. But I know he did Dallas. I think he did something in Austin and San Antonio. I wonder if it was – I can't remember if it was all one episode or not. That was one episode. I think it was like episode four or five of the first season. And then – um there uh they did another texas episode in another season and i had to like i didn't have tv i had to like go to a friend's house to go watch it when it came out uh we had like a little watch party you know and uh uh anyhow um they did a they did another texas episode in like a later season and they actually went by uh 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 this guy no uh king string bulls and um I forget the guy's first name, but his last name is King, and he, he raises bucket bulls, and he's like a PRCA bullfighter. And uh, they they went to uh, his place, actually, mm-hmm. in one of those later seasons, which was really cool. So it just progressed from there, and I would just leverage every little thing I could and learn as much as I could and, mm-hmm. and you know. How was that experience, though, like riding and doing that whole episode with him, you know, from, from your perspective, like being a part of it? Oh, man. It was, it was, it was huge. We actually got really wild that night and, uh, could have easily gone to jail. We got out. I got, I got to break down that story. Um, Joey and Can- Joey Cano was yeah. involved in that story. Slap side cycles. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course I invited him cause he, at the time he was like the dude, you know, he still is the dude, but he was like in San Antonio. Yeah. It was like, he was the only guy I knew in that town that was really building bikes. It mm-hmm. was like, holy shit. Like yeah hey joey like they're coming in like i need you there like you know but he doesn't really like the spotlight like that yeah yeah. i'm like look at me look at me like i want to leverage everything he's like i don't i don't want to really yeah be on tv that much but anyway he he came and he was there and uh you know he brought one of his builds and stuff and uh we partied really hard that night we went to the the phantom room afterwards which is now lonesome rose and uh uh, when Joey first started that that bar, it it originally was the Phantom Room. It was more like a club. Yeah. And uh, let me go pee. We'll That's break. Fine. Yeah, yeah. You down to hear this story? Yeah, I want to. Yeah. It's pretty good. You good? Yeah. So, I mean, you can imagine this this highlight. You know, I'd turn this 
old warehouse that was a trap house or a punk rock venue and a, and then turned into a trap house into a little motorcycle shop and uh you know was able to get enough attention to be able to get it onto national television yeah and um i'm still playing in this rock band you know i have dreadlocks i'm like the dude that used to ride bulls and uh you know, so I'm just like blowing all that up as much as I can. Yeah. And I got a lot of criticism. You know, people hate it when you when you really put yourself out there in that way, but I didn't give a shit. I wasn't going back to Walmart. I wasn't going back to some hot rod shop where I wasn't yeah. getting paid. Like I'm leveraging every little bit of this that I can. Yeah. And um anyhow, it was working. And uh so we do this show. Norman Reedus comes. I, I was doing like little events and little cool stuff as much as I could over there at the shop. So I invited a bunch of my friends to come for like this shop party. Bring your bikes, bring this. Like it, they're gonna, there's going to be some filming, this and that, but I didn't tell them it was going to be on national television. I definitely didn't tell them that Norman Reedus was going to be there. Yeah. So Norman Reedus like rolls up. Like people come. All of a sudden, all the producers are coming. The cameramen are coming. They're setting up. They're checking the lighting. They're doing this and that and the other. So my friends are realizing, all right, some shit's going down. And then Norman Reedus rolls up, takes off his helmet, and they're like, holy shit. And this was at the time when walk, The Walking Dead was like everything. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I had uh, one friend of mine that's this bike guy, and he was kind of shy, and he loved The Walking Dead. Like yeah. He was obsessed, him and his wife. And I invited him to come out. But between the time of everything happening it was it kind of took a long time before norman actually got there and um he got on his bike and he was like hey uh i'm i'm, I'm gonna run to the store real quick i was like all right man like hey you better come back like pretty quick i'm telling you don't leave he said all right yeah yeah, yeah i'll come back he didn't come back he just left and like 30 minutes later like norman Reedus just shows up For real? <laughs> yeah dude i mean he was kicking himself so bad after that because he was like a mega he was like out of everyone there, he was definitely the biggest fan. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really know who this guy was. Like, I had to tell, I told one of my, I told one friend about it. And um, he's like, dude, you don't know who he is? Like, you got to watch the movie Boondock Saints. Yeah, yeah. I knew about The Walking Dead, but I didn't know him outside of that. And uh, so anyway, he shows up. Um, it's a great time. He was a, really just a really nice guy. He was tired as shit, you know, like, um uh do you seem very genuine like in super. his in, in what he was trying to do with that show you know what i mean he was very genuine you could tell he was definitely like more down to earth and def the last thing he wanted to do was come off as some pretentious like hollywood person yeah and you could tell like you know he was tired of shit like they had partied hard they were like on a back-to-back -back schedule going yeah. everywhere doing this this show and um uh, but he was, he was really great. They were kind of like, he was making sure to get pictures with everyone. They were kind of having to like push him out of there. And, uh, it was this great time. So it's like the end of the night, they're gone. You know, we had already been drinking. There's a campfire. Like we're having this great time. We're like, let's continue the party. Let's go to Joey's bar, you know, the Phantom Room. So we're all hopping on bikes and like, you know, my friends are on, they're like cafe bikes and Joey's like on his, uh, you know, one of his choppers. I think it was like that BSA at the time. Um, and then, you know, I had some other friends that had some like choppers, sportsters and stuff that they were building. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we all start uh, uh, getting on our bikes and one of my friends, uh, Patrick, uh, he he's a he's a small guy but man he can drink mm -hmm. and he holds his liquor really well and uh i didn't realize like we were all a little tipsy and i didn't realize like he was drunk when we left yeah and <laughs> he goes to kick over this bike. he's borrowing his friend's bike and it has one of, it has the that was when like the m units were just starting to come out yeah and it had like that was just when the Bluetooth version came out where you could have that like key or whatever mm -hmm. fob that you could put in your glove and like you could sit it by the bike and, and kickstart the bike. Well, he was kind of having some problems and he was having to kick it a lot and, you know, kicking it and like falling over. And I was just kind of like, oh, you know, is in the grass or whatever. I was like, oh, he lost his balance or whatever. Another friend came up to mine and I'm like, man, I think he's been drinking a lot. 
And I go up to him, like, man, you all right? He's like, yeah, dude, I'm fine. I just, you know, lost my balance. It's all good. I was like, all right, like, cool. Like, just stay in the middle of the pack or whatever. Yeah. So we all hit the bar. Like, we're, we're just, you know, like, so stoked off of everything and just having a great time. Well, you know, we ended up uh, drinking till 2 a.m. and we're leaving there and we're going down the St. Mary's Strip and, you know, there's we're getting to the intersection of uh, the St. Mary's and 281 and uh, uh, there's just cops pulling everybody over mm. and they're like checking people and doing sobriety tests and all this and they're like overloaded. Well, so we're having to like slow down with these cops and there's people on each side of the road and they're pulling people out of cars and all this different shit and there's all this gravel in the road and we pull up to the intersection and um, it's a red light and uh, Patrick's, I think his bike like died or something, mm. right, at the, at the light. Oh shit, with the kickstart? So with the kickstart, he goes to kick it and he kicks it and it just... As he just falls right over. <laughs> like, doesn't even catch himself. Shit. Just falls over at the intersection. And one of the cops, like, notices it. And they're, like, really close by us. Um, and comes up to us with this flashlight. Like, you guys been drinking? I'm like, no, sir. I'm, like, kicking gravel around, like, trying to kind of, like, make it look like, oh, he just slipped in the gravel or whatever. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, okay. Um and at that time patrick's like picking up his bike like i'm helping him pick up his bike like i put mine on the on the uh kickstand actually i think i rolled my bike off the road and like parked it off the off the intersection and like go over there to help patrick because i knew he's fucked up i'm like dude i gotta like help him in this situation joey had already kind of like we were supposed to take a right hand turn but the cops were kind of right there where you would take a right hand turn so we ended up going to the light and just stopping at the red light and then we're trying to take a right and then all this shit happened and joey was already kind of like on the access road ready to get on the highway and saw that the cops were coming to talk to us and like stopped he's like he could have just left you know and he's there i pull my bike over i'm trying to help patrick out he goes to kick it and falls again oh. and the cops said sit there and watched him just to make sure like is this guy really drunk falls again the cop goes <sighs> all right guys y'all all stay right here and and we're like shit he like walks back to his car joey's like already like past that intersection getting onto the on-ramp right that's right there and he looks back at us he's like what the fuck are you guys doing he's like waving he's like go just go look back like the cops walking back to his car patrick like runs over jumps on the back of joey's little chopper that's got this tiny little king and queen seat on it you know or maybe it didn't even have that it might have just been right on the fender wow. and we all just haul ass out of there and and left the bike we left his bike oh, shit. yeah no it wasn't my bike that i put over i it was it was his i ended up putting over and and uh ended up putting it in like a little parking spot and um we hauled ass out of there and uh you uh, still had to go get back on your bike, though, I, right? I had to, yeah, I got back on my bike. Patrick ran and, and jumped on Joe. It's all kind of hazy because it was yeah. real wild. And Patrick hops on that little chopper with Joey, and we just haul ass out of there, and we get back to a buddy's house, and we're all just like, holy shit, like screaming and yelling. Like, it made the night even better. Yeah. It's like we all could have just, just went to jail, away. and now yeah. we just got away with it, and we were on TV. It's like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh uh that was a good time and i ended up getting my van and uh going back that night um like an hour later and and loading his bike back That's up crazy in the van. Didn't even mess with the bike so what what's uh where's norman reedus and those guys Did they end up going back to the to oh the they were on the louisiana that night for real yeah so after they, they loaded him in a cadillac and they had the they had yeah, the move yeah oh, they had man, the move wild. yeah that's wild well, that that's a crazy story, man. That's actually uh, it's pretty rad. Like, but that's kind of the sh that's the kind of shit we live for, right? You know what yeah, I mean? yeah. I mean, I'm trying not to be that stupid anymore. Yeah, I mean, but we got to do it a little but bit. But yeah, right? yeah, exactly. You got to do it to realize not to do it. Yeah, exactly. And and you you don't have to think about doing it. These are situations you just kind of end up in. Yeah. You know, um, that one beer you get when you show up to your buddy's shop and turns into, I guess we're doing this today. You yeah, know I mean? yeah. It's just like. And sometimes they just, you know, it just flows like that, man. And that that makes sense, though. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got a DWI before. It 
It sucks. I didn't get it on a bike though, which was uh, been like good, I guess, because I don't think I would have got one on a bike mm-hmm. to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, yeah, man. I, I ever since then, when I got it, it made me drink more because I used to only drink when I would go out. So then I started drinking at home, mm-hmm. but then I would still go out every once in a while. So it's like I started drinking more, and only recently, within the last like maybe eight months, have I kind of tapered back. Mm. And the only time I really get fucked up is on podcasts now, which is probably not good <laughs> for the listenership side of things. You know uh, I think it's fun. I think it loosens you up a little bit. You know, it can make it. Yeah. It makes it yeah, When you're at hour 459 or four hours and 59 minutes and you're like, fuck it, we're, keep, we're, keep, we're going. We're going, dude. It's like I'm, I, have a, I have a bad habit of not wanting to end the party sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, especially like. When you're trying to get a lot of different people in the studio, like I had mentioned, you had the studio up in Dallas, <clears throat> and you find like everything finally comes together. Those are the podcasts that, like, bam, you're already at two hours. You're like, fuck, yeah, I don't want this to end. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, it happens quick, man. It does. It does. That was a night that we didn't want to end, and uh, yeah, we got we got wild and and we got away with it, <laughs> and it was, it was a hell of a lot of fun. Yeah, you know. Um, so anyway, that yeah, that was a good time, and 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 that was a big turning point for for uh, me in the motorcycle industry for sure. Yeah. So after that whole situation, did like more opportunities start to arise through like builds and invited <clears throat> situations and things like that, or a, l- a little bit. You know, it it wasn't there was never there hasn't ever been any point in my life to where it was like a light switch switch on and 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 the next day everything was like lined up and shit was it was yeah. it's always just a stair Gradual, step yeah yeah but every little thing helps man as long as you're moving up and forward and not going back i mean sometimes you have to go backwards to move forwards yeah, you know yeah. but as long as you're progressing little by little you know that's good and that and that was the next step for me uh getting that opportunity and then after that <clears throat> and uh kind of ever since then to be honest it's been like I'm always getting hit up for TV shows. For real? Yeah, all the time. And I, th- I got actually hit up for Big Brother at one point. I didn't know what it was. I'd ask my girlfriend what it was. Yeah. And they were like needing somebody. They were like needing somebody from the country or whatever for this deal. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. Like, I, I, I was always open to everything yeah. media-wise. I'll do anything. I'll leverage anything. And um, I was like, yeah, yeah, but, you know, I'm a year. At that point, I was doing a lot of builds. And it's like, this was a few years ago. I was like, yeah, I'm uh, in a year. I was already booked for a year for like doing bike build stuff. Yeah. And which, you know, one to two bikes didn't take you that. So anyhow, um, you know, I had to like turn that down, but I, I, it was a revolving door and kind of still has been, um, for like television spots for the next like stupid, you know, discovery channel, whatever, but it never would pan out. I, I feel like, uh, what lends you to that as well is that you're outgoing enough to where they don't have to pry things out of you. Like, they can just put a camera on you, and they're going to get something out of it. You know what I mean? Maybe you have to direct you here and there, but for the yep. most part, you're going to carry yourself through the situation, and, and you can speak and all those type of things, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, when a lot of people, for me growing up and all this, like, man, when are you going to get on TV? Back in the biker build-off days and shit. Right, yeah. I was like, I don't think I'm made for TV, man. Like, yeah. we did the whole pilot thing for, you know, the... The biker build-off thing when it kind of resurfaced back in 2014 uh-huh. and or 13, I think it was. And man, when I sat in there across from the camera, you know, it was like, here's the camera, and you know, you're the the producer, and you're like, hey, so <clears throat> tell the camera how yes. you feel about that other bike guy. I was like, oh well, you know, like we don't really see eye to eye yep. now, but you know, I, I still like the guy. And she's like, no, like say you don't like him, and then flip the camera off. And yeah, I'm like, that's exactly it. I don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's it's unscripted in the fact that they don't hand you a script. Yeah. They just tell you what yeah. to do. It's, you know what I mean? It, it it's 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 so shitty and yeah. it's it's so cringy and uh, I didn't really know to what extent um and then and then uh you know immediately after doing having that spot on AMC it was just like I had like production companies after me and i didn't know how it worked you know i just thought like all right discovery channel wants a show and they just make a show it's like no production companies go out they find the talent they like put together a concept 
and they if they it. get further in it, they pitch it. Maybe they'll make a sizzle reel, and that's as far as I've ever gotten. Like, and they did a sizzle reel, and uh, the guy that pr- they hired a guy to produce a sizzle reel who like produced like Diesel Brothers and their sizzle reel and other like shows sizzle yeah. reels. And um, anyway, you know, we did a sizzle reel at the shop, and but the problem I always had is I always worked for myself, and they're like, no, we need like other people working with you. Right, because we don't want to just put a camera on you all day by yeah. yourself. Like you need to feed off of other people and vice versa. So I was like calling my buddies in, and we were like making a mock shop and different stuff for this. I mean, I was like I said, I was desperate. Like I would do anything. Mm-hmm. And um, anyhow, uh, that's when it started opening my eyes about how dumb this shit was. And then like streaming started coming along, and it's like, all right, TV's dying. But to this day, still like, you know, I have guys hitting me up, and it looked like a decent all right, maybe this could be good. Like, I'll, I know how to kind of weed them out now and, like, try to find somebody, a yeah. producer who's ready to do something different, do something that's more mature, do something that's more about the craft. And, um, you know, I, I had even brought some, you know, now that I'm working here at Revival, it's still had, like, producers and stuff hitting me up, and it's like, all right, well, like, let me, I work at a shop now, so maybe we can make this work, but, you, you know, it has to be within the context of what this shop wants. It's like, yeah, I can be a character or the main character, whatever you think mm. it should be, but like, it's not just me anymore. I can't just say, yeah, like, it's true, let's do it. Like, now you have to go through other people. And yeah. now we got to have Skype meetings with like four people instead of just me and you on the telephone, you know? And um, just those kind of, and they just never pan out. And I, I, it's the older I get, the more I'm like, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to subject myself to that? Um, you know, it's, it like man all this stuff that i'm doing like the last thing i want is someone with a camera over my shoulder all the time like to, hey hold up can you redo that again yeah. well, hey can you you know it's like no i just want to build shit and go home now what about this concept if i think the the way public views something is like if it's not if it doesn't last if it's not a second season show they don't do they blame the production team or they blame the you as the person in the video right yeah so it's kind of a weird thing where like a lot of people don't understand that how much you don't have a say in all this you're just kind of like doing what they say and hoping that they understand the world of what they're doing and then when it doesn't work and you knew it wouldn't work because it's stupid and then you're you kind of take the back end of like oh he had a failed tv show once right you know what i mean it's almost like once you have a failed one it's like they're not going to come back at you you know what i mean I get what you're saying. I think the biggest problem is, and this is going to sound bad, but I think you it has to be stupid to be successful. Yeah, it does. It does. The the audience, the people, the people that are going to go home and watch American Chopper or whatever, mm-hmm. they they're not going to sit there and watch two hours of you like explaining how to like really build shit or yeah. like oh, you know what I mean. It's like. No, they want to crack some Budweiser's and watch, like, you know, a dad and son throw chairs at each other. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't, I really, the older I get and the more I get into this craft, I'm like, I don't know if there's a middle ground between what I would want and what television would want and what would be successful that, that could actually be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, like the Diesel Brothers deals, it's like, those guys don't, like, from what I've heard, I mean, I don't know, but what I've heard, and I haven't watched that show a lot, but the main guys, the main characters, they don't really work on trucks. And like, they the the trucks are built in like other shops and there's teams that are doing shit around the clock and they're like it, it's not none of it's like really reality mm-hmm. and i i just don't see at this point in in my life and in my craft i don't see how where tv could fit in to be yeah. honest yeah honestly man if i could find a way i mean i have a million ideas for something that would be great on youtube you know what i mean mm-hmm. but I like the YouTube concept better because, you know, if you can produce, you know, four 20 to 30 minute episodes a month, then you're kind of on point with creating something that's very uh, beneficial for an audience and you can grow better and you, you still have control over it. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but the, which you're right. Like, yeah, you could, you can definitely do that, but that's like a, so much work and such another skill set. Like yeah. I got to build bikes. I can't also like film and produce a show. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and 
And then also you're going to do it for a long time with no money, with no reward. Yeah. You know, so it's just, it's a whole nother skill set. It's a whole nother full-time job. And um, respect to people that are like big on YouTube. Yeah. Like respect, like people don't realize like how much work that is. I mean, you know, me just doing my podcasting just a little bit is like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. Just for me to like sit down for a couple hours and, and, and edit oh, and trim it and put the little intro music and upload mm -hmm. it and put a description and put the links and put this and that and the other with no video, by the way. Yeah. And that's a whole nother set of things to line up and do. It's like, man, this is a lot of work. Imagine me making like YouTube content of me actually working and still having to get the work done and yeah. then produce it into a show and then put it out and then make sure it's popular enough, which how it, dude, there's so many videos on YouTube. How are you going to make people like, like your shit? Well, all right, you got to have the good thumbnail and you got to like reply to comments and you got to like push the shit and you got to promote the stuff on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and TikTok. And you need to create different uh, ways that you promote it on catered to those different social media platforms yeah, yeah. and all this and that and the other. It's like, that's really what you got to do to be successful in the game nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then I want to build bikes too and be, you know, or paint in your case yeah. or do whatever. I mean, it's a lot, man. I mean, kudos to you for this setup that you, that you got right right here Thank and you. like packing it out of your car. Like, it's a lot, man. Yeah, it's a lot. I thought that I could uh, probably fit all of this in like one good size Pelican case until I started getting other products and putting them on the table, and I was mm -hmm. like, "Fuck, yeah," you know, because mm -hmm. I got to figure it out because I got two big major cross country trips that I'm trying to take this video stuff on the road, and one of the trips I got to put a full bagger paint job in my jeep along with all this shit and take it to washington fitting so. that paint job in your jeep and and what what you're driving it's not like a, a jeep wrangler it's like a jeep what? it's a grand cherokee so grand it's a little cherokee. bit bigger than the small one right. so it's SUV. space yeah yeah just fitting a bagger paint job yeah it's tough is one yeah i mean when i used to work at bins and bikes it was like you know there was like several moving blankets put out for when paint would come in yeah. and like spread everything out like it takes up a lot of square footage just for it does all that much less all the camera gear just, i wonder if we caught my dog farting on i audio. didn't hear it i heard it <laughs> i don't think the audience did but that'd be funny if they did that's dope but no yeah. yeah it is tough man but you know you know the the video even even like you know I, I did the podcast with matt jackson earlier this morning and then now sitting here with you like you guys are the first two on the road video podcast i've done and so I hope that they're great, but I know that whatever I do in five months is going to be better as right. far as like how it looks and whatnot. Yeah. I wish that I could find a way to use like my actual, you know, that camera versus these camcorders because mm -hmm. that has such, such a better cinematic look to it. Um, but I can't get it to stay on long enough to do a two hour podcast. Right. So yeah. There, I, and I'm, I'm a painter. I'm, a, I, I'm, you know, I wrench, I do things like that. You're I'm, married. Do you have any kids? I'm. I got two kids. Dude. I'm married. How do you uh, do? Fucking, how do you do this already? Yeah, I. Uh, I was thinking to myself. Like, I was laying in bed last night before I had to wake up at four to start this trip today, and because uh, I, I can't really say, I can't say too much about it on the podcast yet. But we just put together this whole build off thing mm -hmm. where I'm also in it building a bike, but I'm also creating another like angle of creating how do you say it like me and another friend are creating a show that we're gonna have to run for the next foreseeable future every year and i'm like i'm so excited but i'm like why the fuck did i do that like a motorcycle show or a tv show or no like well like an actual thing that we're gonna do in conjunction with a, another event that takes place in texas and okay a whole thing and then Got of you. course and then you want to do all the content for it and the media exactly. stuff for it right yeah so, so I you're basically wanna, producing a motorcycle show yeah. and effectively like a tv show or youtube I, I love painting a lot like it's definitely something i love but i have more i'm getting more out of doing this and i'm getting more out of wanting to do more with my camera as far as photography and video and um, it's kind of a hard swallow because when I sit down with guys like you, I also want to be you. You know, I'm I'm close. I'm not there. I'm, I'm when I say I'm close, like I'm still years away, but I'm I'm still closer than the average guy to get off. You the street. still you still want to work with your hands. You you exactly. still want to build something that 
that you can photograph and that you can talk about on podcasts and yeah. what you know what I mean. Well, like, are you able to monetize this and your oh, photography yeah. enough? Photography, no, because everybody has a camera, but it does help everything. To offset Podcast, the painting? Like, can you monetize this enough to offset what you make painting? Yeah, I mean, if I didn't have the shop, I could live off the podcast. Got you. That's so, awesome. Um, well, dude, kudos to that. That's hard work. People don't people don't realize how much work this is. Yeah. And how, like, there's a million podcasts. There's a million YouTube channels. Like, yeah. I, there's more than a million. Like, yeah. there's millions. And to be able to, like grow an audience enough and get enough subscribers and get enough patreon or whatever to mm -hmm. be able to make money even just like make any money at all yeah. much less be able to make you know what a full-time job would make like yeah. that's that's tough dude and uh i don't think that people appreciate that enough yeah i mean especially nowadays because i mean don't be wrong like i have i have a i've had great support with this podcast since day one but at the same time it's a uh the internet's free and a lot of things that we consume on the internet is free. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that, it's always going to be hard to get crowdfunded support yep. versus like just sponsors. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but also it's like, I don't, I don't, you know, I like doing them and I, I don't ever want it to be about the money, but you know, I'm, I, I'm essentially, I spent a whole day today here and I have, I have a 20 plus helmet waiting list. I have five bikes in my shop that's need to get painted right now. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm at the height of my career in painting mm -hmm. and subsequently also in, in some weird, you know, space that I never thought I would be with this podcast stuff and also trying to turn it into something more like, even though this video stuff is still like getting edited through here. So I'm not having to cut them back and forth like mm -hmm. after this. Yeah. I still got to edit it. I still got to cut the bathroom break out. I got to fucking throw a little music at the beginning and the end. Right. There's yep. still Sp ads. Ads. There's still yep. a little bit of editing involved. So it's like, maybe it's not going to be a six hour deal to put this video out, but it's probably the first couple of times going to take two to three hours to put it out. You know, yep. it's now on a podcast. That's, that's half a work day. Exactly. Um, at least, but I guarantee you, if you really track the time, Oh yeah. Have yeah. you had any like all right, let me put this gear away. Let me put it back in the car. Let me pull it out of the car. Let me put it in my house. Let me unpack it again. Let me turn the computer yeah. on. Let me plug it in. Let me like, yeah, okay, maybe it takes you three, four hours of editing, but how much extra does it take you outside of that just yeah. to get to the editing part and the uploading part? Like, you're probably even selling it short there. That's it's it's probably time. a whole day yeah, it's, to edit. It's time. Like it, you know, in, in reality. In I've gotten to a point too where I used to just like I'll try to work at the shop all the way up until the moment a guest shows up to do a podcast and then I'll just have like a change of clothes real quick so I don't look all dusty and shit. Yep. And I always hate myself after that because I don't prepare for the job of hosting a podcast and mentally prepare to ask questions to be on a on a on a playing field to where I'm like when I, when I reached out to you about doing this podcast, I immediately started consuming everything that you've ever put out there mm -hmm. to just give myself an understanding of as much things that you've made available for me. Right. Yeah. And you know, Rogan will read the book for the guest that's coming on. You know what I mean? And I just consumed the podcast <clears throat> that you made, the podcast that you've been on. And I try to, you know, create a better podcast, asking the questions or, or kind of going down places that, maybe weren't in those other ones. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because at this point now, I mean, we're all, I'm five years deep into my podcast alone. Now, mm -hmm. podcasting in general is now almost 15 years old. So I'm not getting to get the first time you got on a podcast podcast ever now, right? Right. So, and I don't want the regurgitated version of how, of, of your origin story. 100%. So I have to find a way to, get the tidbits but find the questions in between the questions that the other guys asked so the job's harder in a sense than it, than it initially was for the first podcast that you would do or the first uh, podcaster that, that would talk to you right yeah. yeah um yeah because why why you know if if i mean in one way or the other whether it's for money or not you're se you're selling this podcast it's yeah. like why why are people going to want to buy it if you know there's other versions already out there exactly you know with this interview or whatnot so yeah it's a it's it's a lot of work, but back to what you're saying, I mean, you're at this point where it's like, you know, your paint's popping off, 
your podcast is popping off, which is probably bringing you a lot of opportunities for your shop and yourself. And now mm-hmm. you're, you know, putting on this show and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And you, you, why not do YouTube? Like, yeah, you know, and man, I know that struggle, like being in the band, it's like, all right, Hey, things are starting to go well. And like, but the bike stuff's going well at the same time. And then it's like, Oh, I started rodeo and again. And it's like, actually that stuff's kind of going a little bit well. It's like, where do you, you have to choose like something yeah. has to give. Yeah. And that's where it's coming to, man. That's, that's the hardest thing I've had to swallow over the last couple of years is, uh, finding a way to rebalance things in life because for the last 20 plus years, it's been paint paint's been dominant. And then now the podcast is like almost to a point where, you know, like I, I still don't trust it. Does that make sense? Yep. I know it's, yeah. it's, it's like, it's hard to get a painter. It's easy to get a podcast. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't, I don't trust the medium, the, the format. I think that the reason why I'm jumping into this type of stuff, like trying to take the video on the road is I don't know where this shit's going to go, but if I just assume that podcasts are going to be the same way they were in 2017 for the next 20 years, yep. then I, I feel like I'm going to, when things do change, I'm going to be so behind the curve that I'm not going to be able to keep up. And I would have essentially, I gained a lot by doing a podcast and, and speak, even speaking to you, I gained a lot of knowledge and understanding of, of a lot of Texas and a lot of what it's like to grow up here. But I'm, you know, if you look 20 years down the line and I spent 15 years doing a podcast that, you know, now all the episodes are gone. It's like, it's not like some other network. It's not like, you know, Netflix is going to pick it up and throw it on their show and carry it on. Yeah. Like I still got to continue to pay to host this shit for the next rest of my life. Yeah. Even if I don't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, it's a weird place to be, man. So it's like, I, I want to downsize paint, which I have drastically, but not quit because I don't ever want to, I don't want to get out of practice with that. I want to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the thing is too, though, I think, you know, how many, you said, how many helmets are you I doing? usually do about 48 helmets a year and four to five bikes. Including yeah. my, I usually paint a bike or two for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you did two bikes and, and, about, ten, and 10 helmets, you'd be just as relevant. Yeah. Like you're, yeah. you're putting out so much shit that like the people that even follow you probably can't even keep up with all the shit you're working yeah. on. So, you know what I mean? It's like you could cut that down a fraction. Yeah, we do. About, and still say just as relevant. Like people are still going to like. Yeah. That's a lot of shit, dude. You're yeah, painting we, a lot of stuff. Like, we also have a camp out that's become wildly successful. This is we're going on our sixth year. Um, we had a thousand attendees last year at it, um, and then we've hosted other events in Dallas that have been good. We we, we want to get in. I want to get into more of the event space to kind of coincide with the following of the podcast and everything else. Events are where the money's at. I haven't figured out how to monetize it, but I've it's all trickled in like into listenership or opportunities in paint, right? Everybody everybody likes when you do shit for them and, it, and you're not making money on them. And then when you start right. making money, everybody's like, he sold out. He's fucking, he's not punk rock anymore, whatever the fuck, you know? Right, 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 right. So there's always I that fine with, line. There, there's people that really know how to do events, though. Yeah. Um, I mean, this place is a testimony to that. Revival Cycles doing the handbuilt show. Yeah. They do really well in the handbuilt show, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that comes down to sponsors i mean you 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 get big sponsors and the money that they give you covers the cost yeah and then everything off of that you you take home mm-hmm. you know what i mean and uh you know it's a win-win because they need to stay relevant yeah you know uh, the, the sponsors do they don't have the time to like put together a thing like that and really be a part of the community like they have to go through somebody like you yeah to really stay in touch i mean that's why you you have sponsors on this podcast yeah yeah they don't have time to produce this kind of shit and talk to me like they got parts and stuff to make and and things to ship you know so you're that medium so if you can leverage that medium a show or it's like you know you're you you're giving value you know but if you know you get the sponsors to foot the bill basically and then you're able to like sell some tickets, sell yeah. some alcohol, sell this or sell that or sell like vendor space or whatever. Yeah. You know, it would help, you know, and I, I did, you know, I've, I've toyed with all that shit back and forth, but you know, at the same time, it's, um, I also want to party at them. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and not like be at work the whole time. So it's all That's set up. That's what I'm not like. Like the handbelt show has been a party for me every yeah. year. And this year now, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to work that thing. Like I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. I'm like, man, I'm going to be up late every night working hard. And like, I'm still, we're still going to party a little bit, but like, oh yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. But. Man, I think you're the type of guy, and you got enough going on. Like, if you wanted, if you focus in on this podcast, hundred percent, you'd be yeah wildly successful in it. I think if you you know you focus on your paint, hundred percent, you'd be wild successful. Not even hundred percent, eighty percent, sixty percent, whatever it is. Like, I think anything that you choose, you're gonna like make money off of it. You're gonna be successful in it. And you, you know, you talked about like worrying about staying relevant. And it's like, man, you you got you got enough backlog. You got enough. Uh, you know, you got your foot in enough different places that you, I think you're at a point where you can pick and choose what you want to do mm-hmm. and make your money either way. Well, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit, uh, maybe I'm being, I'm overthinking it, but like, you know, I understand the fears though. So you know? like I said, I just, we just celebrated five years, literally this, this week of doing this podcast and we just, you're episode 303 or yeah. So that's I that's awesome, dude. So Congratulations to you. I I I, I had my podcast for a year. I'm on episode like 13. Yeah. <laughs> it's a um, lot, man. Like that's so I'm trying to say like there's got I mean there's a it was always the fear getting into this that that big money was going to come into it sooner or later and put big name shops in those roles to do podcasting and was going to quickly jump to the top of the heap if that makes sense, you know what yep. I mean? And and this is no dig at all whatsoever, but that that oil and whiskey podcast is very new, and it's mm-hmm. well produced, and those guys are already famous in another world. Yep, and that's kind of what I was talking about. It's like with their success, more of those type of shops are going to come into the space. Like for the last four years, like we've been a top ten podcast in the automotive world mm-hmm. in all of America, yep. meaning the Diesel Brothers and Adventure Rider Radio <laughs> and Yamcast and all these other, we were in the top ten of that for the consistently for the last you know four years, and but a lot of a lot of people don't know how much work it's going to be until they get into it. Like yeah. the roaster shop guys, mm-hmm. and it was awesome. I actually went over there and I was at a motorcycle show in Chicago, Moto Block, mm-hmm. and uh, I stopped into the because they're out they're in like a suburb of, outside of Chicago or whatever, yeah. and I stopped into their shop because. <clears throat> had connected with a few of their guys that work with them on, uh, through Instagram and, uh, just how they run things and how those guys do things, man, they're really on top of it. And they've built those things up well enough to where they'll probably be able to allow themselves like a little bit of time and a little bit of money to venture out and do something else really proper. Mm -hmm. The amount, I think the amount of shops that are going to have, the ability to do that are few and far between. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or even want to do that. You know? I mean, how yeah, many how sense. many roadster shop type shops are there out there? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Not a but lot. Like I said, I, I didn't want that to sound like a dig at all because it's... it's no, but that's, a, that's a legitimate yeah. concern. You know, it's like if you, if, you know, you got a wife and kids and if you're going to like cut your paint shop in half to try to do a podcast and then you have a roadster shop that's like, hey, let's do a podcast and then podcast one is like the fucking shit in a badass studio with cameras and like yeah. produced and this and that and the other you're like i could see why you'd be like oh fuck yeah like how am i gonna keep up with this but at the same time i don't think there's m- very many people at all especially in this industry that are gonna venture out into media and do it at the level that those guys will do it at yeah yeah and then also man the listeners decide yeah they do that's 100 percent. you know uh they they uh you know, it's like they, they threw me out there on uh, their podcast on like a segment. They do like a shout out to mm-hmm. other shops and like people who are, are uh, doing cool stuff, which I think is really cool to do. Yeah. And they gave me a shout out on their podcast. And um, it wasn't like my shit blew up. Maybe I got like three followers that day or something. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like. They're doing it, and 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 they're doing it for the right reasons because they want to do it because they want to like uplift the culture or whatever. But I doubt that they have like a massive audience now. Give them five years. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's always been the hard thing for a lot of other podcasters coming into this. Is that for the first 
year, the first fifty episodes, you feel like you're 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 pissing in the wind. Like you feel like there's not an audience. You, I'm doing this for fifty people. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. No, I'm definitely pissing in the wind right now. And then now it turns into uh, you know, you have to you, you have to put a podcast out and think like a person that consumes podcast. You know what I mean? Yep. Like the reason why Rogan is so good at it is because we know that we're going to get about 10 to 12 episodes a month. You know what I mean? It's a lot of shit. It's a lot, but I mean, it's set up for that and his, his whole life is conducive to Yeah. Have you listened to, to episode 20, episode 50? Uh, like episode, you know, I mean, well, like, yeah, I have you, gone back. I mean, I'm sure there's episode, people that yeah. have, but now that he's famous and now that he's at like episode 2000 or whatever, yeah. you know what I mean? Sure. People will go back and be interested, but like, those people at the first like hell no yeah, yeah but but yeah you're right consistency is the key like i don't i've been listening to more podcasts now and um honestly i don't i don't really uh you know i listen to the oil and whiskey one every once in a while but for me i've gotten more into listening to comedians podcasts oh they're the best they 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 podcasting is designed for comedians right right we're all finding a we're all finding our foot in it because they have great so you get humor you get uh, you get a, a insight <clears throat> that you know it's funny to be funny you have to have insight you know what I mean yep. otherwise you're a Gallagher and you're yeah. just you, then a podcast doesn't work for you right you're just smashing fucking things on a stage um, and they you know they they are able to kind of riff and take and 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 they're 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 famous. They're in the world of fame, but they're not in that world, so they get to hang out there and make fun of it. So, right? Yeah, they're just enough where they're at the same party with really famous people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's great, but you know, getting back to how you're saying, it's like you got to think how people that consume it. I'm getting out of where I'm in habit, where it's like, all right, it's been if, like four or five days. Like there should be a new Tim Dillon episode out. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm waiting for it. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? But I'm not necessarily waiting for, like, you know, uh, other other ones. You know, yeah, there's yeah. just those few that's yeah, like you get connected to those ones. Yeah, you get connected yeah. to it. And I'm noticing too. The other thing is, is, um, uh, and I do my mine podcast, Colt Wrangler Radio, is it's just all interviews. Mm -hmm. I just know so many people. Yeah, just like you do. You get in the industry or or you get into different things and like you meet so yeah, many people. people. You're like, fuck, this guy's interesting as hell at this party. Like he'd be a great interview. So I'm just like interviewing people. But I've noticed that the podcasts that I've latched onto the most are usually not ones where it's an interview. Cause you're always taking a chance. You're like, you know, I'm sure that they're interviewing this person for a reason, mm -hmm. but like I don't know, this guy, he wrote this book that's like a New York Times bestseller. Like, uh, do I want to commit the next three hours? Yeah. You know, it's like, all right, maybe I'll give it 15 or 20 minutes to see if it's interesting or not. But like a lot of the times I'm getting more interested in the ones where it's just the person solo or it's like two or three people consistently talking. Right. Yeah. And then an interview one that I'll really like latch onto would be one where they're interviewing someone I already know about or that I already have some sort of interest in. Yeah. So I don't know what yours are like, but um I think that balancing that to where it's like, yeah, you're interviewing people, but then also you're you're just shooting the shit. Yeah. So we did that. So Rogan, you know, when I first started listening to Rogan, which I'm not an OG early Rogan listener. I didn't start to like 2017. Mm -hmm. and then a year later we started our podcast, but, um, I took, I took another page out of his book. Like I started creating a cast of characters out of my friends. And some of my friends are better on the, the microphones than others. Mm -hmm. And some of them have the, if there was a way to capture who they are into the podcast, they would be on the podcast all the time, but some of them just don't do well. Um, right, there's also that medium. It's hard to translate through. Yeah, hundred percent. And so what we try to do is we create. A, I, I want my friends to be those guys that no matter what, I can have. I can. Hey guys, y'all want to come through and let jump on the mics tonight, and then we can get some beers, and we're gonna talk about something that is gonna be interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that someone's gonna like, and then those guys are on there enough where they also have certain guys that like their takes on shit. Okay. So. It's kind of like the protect our parks uh, with right. Rogan. It's like 
those times where you know it's like this isn't like serious time. This is let's have fun, and maybe some seriousness comes out of it. But ultimately, this is fun. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, I I feel like a dumbass at the end of those podcasts when we've done four hours and there's fucking a, a tower of beer this tall <laughs> on the table, and we're you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, yeah. And then like you get you get such mixed reviews on the outside looking in where some guys are like, dude, that was fucking fun watching y'all do that on the on the live they're getting last the party night. with you basically yeah and but then there's other guys that are like catching it on the audio version while they're you know right. hey why uh, telling their wife like you got to check this podcast i love this podcast and it's the one where we're fucked up drunk and <laughs> slurring and he's trying to play to his wife on yeah. a road trip and she's like what the fuck is this exactly. like yeah no uh well that one that one that you did uh with uh david and uh andrew the cafe races of instagram guys like um you had other people with you on that one as well so right? my so my one of my guys that's on the podcast very regular his name is Jaden, but we call him dragon was he the guy that was being super funny during yeah, that in the back dude he, he's he fucking made me laugh so much yeah like and i didn't know if you were bringing other people and i and to be honest like i haven't listened to, you, to your podcast yeah, a lot like that was just the the one i i after you reached out to me I went to it and then I saw that that was like a recent episode. I'm like, Oh, I know those dudes. Yeah. Like, let me listen to that. And, uh, uh, that guy had me cracking up. And, um, so hundred percent, like that shit makes it more interesting. Like, um, dude, let's, let's do one of those with you and your buddies. Yeah. If you want to come up to the studio, I, I would mean, love to, could, I would love to get, the house. dude, I'd love to get drunk and like talk a bunch of shit. Yeah. And, uh, so Jaden and, and my other buddy, we have, there's two guys. We were, we were actually both down here, uh, in Austin for that, this thing at house of Harley. Or, That's uh, right. Yeah. You were here. At, um, Cowboy Harley, uh, our buddy that used to run Cowboy Harley went to Milwaukee and now he's back running this place. So we're just coming down to support him, but we haven't. The last time me and my friends came down here and partied in Austin was when the Easy Rider show was here in 2019. So mm. we were like, dude, let's run that back. We had a blast. So we came down here, and immediately a couple of people that run bars around here, like the White Horse, they're like, hey, dude, come out here. Yeah, You know, we'll, we'll get you in. We'll get you a tab going, blah, blah, blah. So we come out, and, you know, the, my, my, my friends are just funny. And yeah. they all consume podcasts as much as I do. Uh -huh. And we all like the same type of podcast. So we all kind of have the same energy. We haven't quite figured out how to turn it into something different yet. We do a couple of things called Quaint Zones. Uh, and on our, it's on our YouTube. Um, and it's just us three kind of getting off of this, like, the fast, like, podcast path. Right. And just doing something more like, you know, hot takes and fucking you know what grinds my gears kind of vibe stuff right you know? yeah yeah and it, it works well but my friend kyle which you didn't hear him on that podcast he was actually in there with no he wasn't in this one but our friend kyle is equally as funny as Jaden, but sometimes he locks up a little bit on podcasts you know what i mean yeah but he's recently he's had us he's been holding court with us dude and having us roll in places oh, so you now you're good um, but yeah, that, that's what we want to do. Like we, I, I don't yeah. want it all to be just this, right? You know, uh, yeah. You're building those characters, yeah. like all that, and then you can bring your interviews in and stuff. The only thing I don't like is when there gets too many people. And uh, do, have you listened to uh, the Flagrant podcast so with Andrew let me, Schultz? Let me tell you, but so I that's my for the last year. That's my the, the reason I started the Quaint Zone. Is because I love flagrant too. Now, as of recently, I've had a hard time with it. It's too much. It's gotten too much. It but, used but to be well like polished. Andrew Schultz is is brilliant, and yeah. so is uh, what is uh, Akash Sink. Yeah. yeah, he's hilarious too. But then it's like they got three other people on a mic, and then they're interviewing people, and then these guys are guys that hang out and, sh and talk shit all the time together. Yeah. So they're just like, it's it's too much, man. It's too hard for me to listen to it. And I'll push through it sometimes, and, like, it'll still make me laugh. But, like, man, I'd much rather just hear Tim Dillon, like, talk oh, shit Tim by Dillon's himself for three amazing. hours. Yeah, Like, you know what I mean? And so... Yeah, it's it. You got to find that balance of like, all right, adding those those extra characters makes it that much more entertaining. But then there's a point where it gets to be too much. Yeah, 
And, uh, you know, yeah. But I, I, I mean, from what I heard, I think you're on the right direction. I, I want to go back now and and consume a little bit more of, of your content. Probably, I could probably send you one or two that are going to be like, some real funny ones, you know what I mean? But, and that's the thing is like, we have, we have a lot, we have a big library of, of podcasts that, you know, and also like uh, an audio wise, they, you know, Spotify and Apple, all the apps, they kind of, they, they archive them. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. So you can only go back like maybe a hundred episodes before you have to like go to our website or YouTube to watch like episode one, two, three, four. Got you. Um, but as of recently, man, like we've been trying to balance that because, I look at it like this, like we, we do five episodes a month guaranteed. Right. And in those five episodes, I'm into photography. So I try to find people in the motorcycle photography or content creator space to kind of learn and and jive off of. Right. But it's a motorcycle podcast. So I still want a fabricator. I still want a painter. I still want a mechanic. I still want these other perspectives. So it's like, I try to tell, or I, I want to balance it to where if we're doing five episodes a month, then I want to try to cover all these bases. I want to have one where we're just having fun and, and talking shit and, and, you know, there's no seriousness involved. Yep. And then I want one that's this and, I mean, it's not always going to be that way, but that's the goal is to continually stay within this umbrella. But some of them are about being fun. Some of them are about being informative. Yep. Some of them are origin stories. Keep some some of them, variety. You know, because after, you know, you just told the, we just got the full, you know, you know, you got a lot. We got the whole thing, right? Yeah, for, yeah. For the most part, right? During the break, I even apologize for rambling so yeah. much. That's how much you get. Like, you got more than anybody's gotten. So, for sure. You know, when you come back on this podcast, we're talking shit. Like, that's all we can do now. Like, we dude, can't get. Let's start talking shit right now. How about that? <laughs> I still got to drive wait? three hours home, dude. <laughs> you got to be at work tomorrow? Yes, I got to pick up my son at, at 8 a.m. and take him. I'm having a uh, this is this is kind of sad. This is gonna kind of dumb it down, but I'm having a Waffle House breakfast. Here's your presents thing because his mom's being a cunt right now. You know what I mean? So are y'all together? Or divorced? Fuck no. We're we've never got we never got married. I, oh, his mom. But you're married. I'm so married you- to a chick that has no kids and doesn't want kids. And my kids are all. I have a 21 year old and a and a 12 going on 13 year old. So 21, dude. How old are you? I'm 40. You don't look it. Uh, thank you. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I'll, I'll start to feel it too, so yeah, I, I yeah. guess I get where you're coming from. But no, Dang, it's uh, dude. That's a lot, man. And I have I have two we, podcasts to tomorrow. Shit. Yeah. Well, I feel bad for rambling on holding tomorrow you up. Tomorrow night's probably going to be a funny, a wild. So That'd be wild, yeah. yeah tomorrow night, we're going live with... Uh, well, I'd, I'd offer you a, a couch to crash uh, on, but it good. seems like you got to get rolling. No, I ha- yeah, I have to be home because I got to... Uh, my son lives in Fort Worth. I live in Waxahachie. So it's a 50 mile one way drive there. Oof. So yeah. we put up this whole Christmas party at my house. Like, decided, you know what? We're going to step up and be the house that invites the family. Going to be a host. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's a small, it, uh, immediate family. So it's very small. My brother, my daughter, my mom. And mom, daughter show up. Brother has a flat tire on the way up, can't make it. Baby's mom with my son just won't budge yeah and i'm like my brother he played in bands he's actually sings and guitars really really good he quit which i wish he wouldn't have but he was he's was, he was on to something mm-hmm. so my son wants an electric guitar so we went to got him a whole kit mm-hmm. so i wanted my brother to be there so when he opened the the thing he right. could tune him and yeah. kind of fuck with him and show him a couple things and yeah and uh it all fucking went to shit so now i'm gonna give him a guitar and an amp and a whole kit in a fucking waffle house parking lot and it's like because his mom's being a cunt. You know what I'm saying? That sucks. So it sucks, man. Don't ever have kids. I, Not yeah, because I, kids are kids are awesome. It's right. It's the it's the other shit outside of the kids. It's like you you, you get me on a tangent, man. It's like, no, no, dude. Yeah. Let's talk about it. I'm fucking Yeah. You have I've, kids. I I I I've uh the more I, I the older I get, the more I start dating, the less I feel like I want to have kids. And then I've dated some moms too. Like not seriously, but like kind of casually like yeah. dated some moms and stuff. And I'm just like, God, this is a lot. Like it was never around the kids or anything, mm-hmm. but just seeing their stress or just having to like, just listen to them mm-hmm. about their baby daddies or whatever. I'm like, God, this is like, why am I doing this? Well, so like, that that's one side of it, right? Right. So I, I've got 
a grown kid and an almost grown a teenager right now and there's the other side of it of like just the headache with the mom or the dad or the or the, you know all the other outside things mm. and then there's the aspect of did you are you fucking this kid up you know what i mean is this kid gonna be mentally fucked up later right, on right yeah yeah um how like you know, did you love them enough? Did you love them too much? Did you, you know, were, like there's all that shit is like amplified now to where it's like you can literally be 10 times better than your parents were and your kids will still fucking resent you. Now, I'm fortunate. My daughter loves me. And so far, I'm on a good track with my son. But just the other people in my world that I'm like, dude, like you're a fucking great dad. Like, why is why is all this happening? It's just. It's just nowadays. I mean, kids getting these echo chambers at school and online, and then one kid's like having issues. So then this kid's like, I think I have those issues too. And right. Next thing you know, yep. like you're a piece of shit dad. They, the atmosphere that they're in that you yeah. can't con really control. Yeah. It's just a weird world to have kids yeah, right now. Yeah. You know I, what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my biggest, like, of course, I don't have anybody that I'd want to have kids with. Yeah. And I am not in a position to, uh, want to have kids or whatever but in the past i always thought i would yeah you know it was just always like yeah i'm a kid like that'd be great mm -hmm. and uh the older i get the more conscious i get about things and the more i learn about the world the less and less i'm like yeah. want to have a child it's like man this is so many things to worry about you know and then the older i get the more particular i get the more i want like things to go well and, yeah. and be just right and and at the same time, the more I'm realizing things are not going to go well, and things are not going to be that right. Like you're not going to have much control over a lot of things yeah. that are going to influence your child. It's like fuck. Yeah. I don't want to do it. You, you got You just got to have your shit together, and you got to be in a right place in life. Which I think most of us, I think most of us, especially in this type of industry, we might have our shit together for certain things that we want, but we don't have our shit together in a way to provide like a quality stable home for a family yeah we're you know we're, we're we're creating luxuries for you know for other people mm -hmm. you know what i mean none of this is necessary for anybody's survival yeah you know we're not keeping cars on the road or keeping people alive in hospitals or shit like that right so oh yeah i think i want a custom sheet metal on my on my bike you know, like you know and you got to hope that you get enough of those to pay the like it's just right it's a hard place to be and then it's like okay well do i give up my dream to go you get that steady job to take care of the family now and then do i resent my family later on because i there's a lot of dynamics there's a into. lot dude and i mean yeah for me i my filter is you know i want to do things that uh that i'm stoked about i want to yeah. do things that i'm proud of i want to produce things i'm proud of and a lot of times if you're a creative person, those aren't things that make a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, you're going to have to sacrifice and, and, uh, yeah, it's all right. If I, if I want to do this, if I want to, you know, build bikes or, or play music or this, that, and the other, it's like, I'm probably not going to make a lot of money. I'm probably not going to have any health insurance. I'm probably not going to have this yeah. or not going to have that and not going to have the other. And so you kind of got to like funnel it down and figure out what's priority and yeah. kids definitely don't fit in that funnel you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and that's what sucks man I, i've been fortunate. even a wife is like tough well <laughs> yeah take that back i am single if you are well off <laughs> trust me we got <laughs> i am open <laughs> three percent women listen to this so we're we're you're not getting any chicks on yeah, this podcast. No, that's a, that's 100 if true. they are if they are listening to it, they could probably wrench better than both of us so. uh that's probably true man <laughs> yeah and they probably don't uh have sex with men either yeah <laughs> no, no no i'm just joking i'm just joking that's i'm three beers in now i'll start saying crazy shit <laughs> well, no, those I, rookie numbers we you come to the studio we're three beers in like in the first 30 minutes Hell yeah, dude. I might be more than three. You've had, I think, probably four. So I think I've had four, and I haven't had dinner. Um, yeah, that's good. But I'm, re I'm ready to keep rolling, dude. Like, all right, where's the joint, man? Like, where's the other stuff? Let's go. We got all that at the shop, so. You got to drive, man. <laughs> yeah, it sucks, man. But, yeah, you know, this is, uh, you know, like the, the kind of the world that you're involved in. Like, it's kind of outside of, you know, my world. And I got introduced to, to David and... And Brandon, who the photographer that was up there 
I'd love it. Oh, that's work. right. It was yeah. it was Brandon that you were interviewing and not uh, Andrew, the other yeah. part of Cafe Races. I met yeah. David through a mutual friend, Big Joe, who does SnapFab, who was – I mm-hmm. met him a years ago because we're both into FXR stuff, and he was on the podcast really early on, mm-hmm. like the first couple of months we did it. He left the hand-built show and was headed back to South Dakota and stopped in the shop or because my shop's right off 35 and up there and stopped yeah. in and we did a pod. So um, trying to expand, you know, into, you know, understanding this world, which we didn't talk much about. But we That gives us something to talk about in the next one. Um Expanded these other like areas of motorcycling that are also customization to kind of not just be pigeonholed into just Harley V twin, you know, T right. bars and yep. you know, shit like that. So Which yeah. is big right now. I mean that's it's, it's kinda crazy to see the shift from like big wheel baggers to like performance Harleys and Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I I felt like um you know, probably the super hooligan stuff was a nice um, medium for that as well. Yeah, I think it helped usher the performance side of motorcycling for another type for a cafe racer guy or a or a sporty guy yeah. or you know even Dyna guy. I mean, it's just and, all kind of helped push in the, the stunt world too. Those were those were. Yeah, I mean now everybody it's like everybody's like doing a wheelie on a Dyna, but used to it was just like everyone was on a six thirty six, yeah, yeah, or you know R six or whatever it was. Um, F four I's, six thirty sixes, nine five fours. It's just it's just crazy to yeah. see. It's it's everything is trends. Back to the yellow the Yellowstone thing and the Western world and everything comes in these waves and these trends, and that's just kind of where the money goes. And you know you got to ride it in one way or the other. You know, yeah. I mean, like a lot of this stuff is you know off of that cafe racer you know like vibe yeah. deal but you know it's off of that trend or whatever and then you know but i'm over here building a uh you know a unit triumph hardtail mm-hmm. you know and and they're dumping a lot of money into it and yeah. so it's like everything just kind of i don't know goes around yeah i mean that's kind of what's cool about it all and i think that um you know uh i've always been interested in the bikes but i think right at one point when I was about to jump into when I was leaving the sport bike world and wanting to get into other types of bikes, the CB 500s and 750s, I think it's 750s, right? Mm-hmm. They were all the rage. And like, this is 2010 ish back when they were cheap. Yeah. Yeah. You can find them all over the place. And I'm like on Craigslist back in the day, like, fuck, I'm gonna get one of these. And then, then the big wheel thing blew up and I had already, a lot of the guys when in the sport bike world that we used to build bikes for, went to the bagger shit and so my money went there and i chased them there mm-hmm. and I, I i built a lot of big wheel stuff rode them did all that stuff and um and paint's huge in that scene it it was i mean i didn't i I, know, I make more money on a diner than i ever did painting big wheel stuff but that's yeah, also that's because crazy. i wasn't i wasn't as good as i am now you know i was still only like 10 years into my craft and mm. um contrary to what a lot of people believe like paint is you can you can get good at a couple of things, but on top of also just getting good at it, you have to get good at fixing all the the problems that the elements throw into fuck paint up, right? Mm. You know, you're in the perfect conditions, no humidity, no no temper, temperature fluctuations, a clean shop, uh, no flies landing in your paint, you know, all this right. crazy shit, like, dictates how good you are at it. And uh, I think that a lot of people get good at paint and then they spend the rest of their life getting better at it, but mostly getting better at fixing mistakes or avoiding mistakes. And it just right. kind of makes a better mm-hmm. job, right? Yep. So, But doing that takes more time. It does. And you got to get paid for that time. Exactly. And that's why you're more expensive. You know, better product. Yeah, 100%. I, so <clears throat> what's, what was the transition between sport bike to now, like, you know, Performance Harley, Dyna, FXR, like... Because I, I have my tra- – I, I I can put the timeline together in my head to where – how I went from sport bike to cafe stuff to, like, you know, tra- a lot of street trackers is basically what yeah, I built yeah. for the past few years. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was simple. Like, like I said, I was at that crossroads where I could have went cafe. Um, 
but there's no money in it. There was enough money to sustain me and keep me going in Big Wheel Baggers, right? Um, and at first, man, I don't, you know, it turned into clown stuff. But at first, I thought and still genuinely think the shit was cool. It was different. It was like, uh, it was a continuation of like big wheels on cars. You know what I mean? I've always been into lowered shit, not so much me race too. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, like, I was like, this is fucking rad. Mm-hmm. And it continually got bigger and it continual, continually got longer. And it's just like the billet chopper era. At yep. first, it was a nice CFL from Jesse James. Right. And then next thing you know, it's this unrideable thing that is a work of art in its own right, but yep. it went, it beard away from uh baseline and that's what big wheel baggers did 100 percent. that's what everything does that's what yeah. the off road that's what the truck shit did mm-hmm. you know now you're right like so like 26 inch rims with tiny little off-road tread tires and crazy but cali lean it's up. a self-correcting it's a self-correcting thing because what, what what it does is is the people that chase that are the people that are not truly in love with what they're doing in that, right? Yeah, instead of like, hey, let me figure out how to do something different that's cool, that that changes the game a bit, that makes my shit stand out. It's like, how do I do something bigger and flashier, mm-hmm. which is way easier to do than create something new. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or, or create something by hand or whatever it may be, you know? And so that's where the trend always goes. It's like, oh, that guy's got 24s. Well, I, I want to be different than him. Let me put 26s on mine. Well, let me put like 28s on mine. Well, let me like. It just keeps going. You know, it just keeps going like that. And, 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 And I think that's why I have such a disdain for anything that goes that direction because yeah. it's like, it, it, it's just a sign of the lack of creativity. And that happens within any sort of genre. I mean, in cafe stuff, it's like, let me put more fucking leather on my shit. Like, yeah. let me, you know. Do whatever it is, you know, let me cut my fender even smaller than the last guy. Or let me put bigger X tape on my headlight. It's yeah. like whatever dumb thing that that scene is like into, you know, the least creative people just take those elements and just blow them the fuck up. Whether yeah. it's big wheel baggers or FXRs yeah, or Dinas or trucks or Harley. I mean, it, you know. it's it's definitely happening right now in the performance bagger side of things. And and I I'm, I was an early adopter of that whole thing, you know, performance bag because I came from big wheels. Yeah. And then I fell in love with Dinas and FXRs, and then the performance bagger thing started popping up in Cali, and I was like, I'm into that because mm-hmm. I miss my bagger. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's rideable. Exactly. Like, and that's so that's the other nice thing. Um, that's always going to happen, man. And but like I said, it, it just it. It it's going to attract all these trends will attract people and some of those people actually fall in love with it and some of them were only interested in what that made them look like to the rest what it mirrored to the world right right mm-hmm. and and that's fine I mean I've, I'm guilty of that in some places in my life right but I'm just glad that you know I found a true love and passion for motorcycles to where you know I'm into that I don't maybe at this point in my life, it's not something I want to buy right now or I want to build or whatnot. But you know, if, if you said, Hey man, I got this bike, let's go rip them around. I'm like, fuck yeah, that's I'm, I'm stoked. Right. 100%. I yeah. love all bikes, yeah. but at the same time, like I'm not in a position where I could just afford to buy all bikes that I've ever wanted. Right. Right. So I yeah. gotta, I gotta make conscious decisions on what types of bikes I'm going to have. I remember the, the second to the last road glide that I bought, I was literally BMW adventure bike, 1200 GS Mm -hmm. or road glide. Yeah. And I wanted that GS so fucking bad, Yeah, but that would have done nothing for my career. Yeah. The road glide runs into my career. Yeah. You know what I mean? So no, I, no, I, I I get it, man. It's just like, you know, people that are, it's, it's like, if you love motorcycles, like you should, you should love it all or at least be able to see. You gotta be open-minded to everything. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's like, it's like, imagine somebody that only listens to one genre of music mm. or one subgenre of music really <laughs> it's like that's insane like anybody now because of the internet everybody's like their playlist is all over the place yeah. everybody nobody's special by having a f- big variety in their playlist anymore yeah. like it's just standard you know but for some reason like when it comes to the car culture or motorcycle culture people just like want to pigeonhole themselves into whatever trend you know um but the more you get into it, the more, you know, you should be able to appreciate all of it. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, but, um, 
No, I, 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 I get what you're saying. And, uh, you know, when I, when I started building stuff, the cafe stuff was really hot and, uh, I, I didn't really like it that much to begin with. I really liked bobbers. Mm. Like that's what I really wanted before I had any motorcycle. And then my dad had like a heritage soft tail Mm -hmm. and it was like midlife crisis purchase, you know? Yeah. And so he taught me how to ride and, and, uh, I got to ride that thing and I just, when I was like 15, 16, I started riding it to school, you know, small town. There's like no stoplights. It's like a couple stop signs. And then I'm like at school, Yeah, but no helmet, no nothing, you know? And it's a pretty big bike to be riding. Uh, if you have no yeah. riding experience prior, but, uh, so I got to ride that to school, like for maybe a week. And then it was in the middle of my parents' divorce and he had to sell it and he sold it. And I was like, I got to have another motorcycle. Yeah. You know, I didn't know what to get. And I just thought all Harleys were expensive, like my dad's Harley, mm-hmm. you know. And I uh, I ended up getting on Craigslist and I bought an R6. And uh, I bought it in Dallas and it was from the, this club owner had it. And it was uh, stretched and lowered. It was Cadillac pearl white. Mm-hmm. and uh, polished frame, chrome swing arm. It was, like, stretched, like, six inches or something okay, yeah. like that. And, um, you know, chrome wheels. It was just chrome and white, completely chrome yeah. and white. And he had a Cadillac Escalade truck that matched it <laughs> that was all pearl white and chrome. And so super gaudy, but, like, it was a cool bike. And uh, I had no idea what I was getting. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like thirty five hundred bucks. It was like low. It was like seventeen thousand miles or something, and it was super clean. Mm. And so I bought it. And uh, the first time I got on, actually, we had a little dirt driveway and a cattle guard. And I'm like, remember, like crossing the cattle guard and going down the dirt driveway. Once I got it home and like unloaded it and getting out on like Ranch Road three eighty six. Mm. There's nobody and just like no helmet. I didn't even have a helmet. Just like get on the thing. I didn't even have glasses on. It's like right, you know, that's how dumb this shit is. I'm like 17. And I just like twist the throttle and this thing takes off. And I just remember like it pushing me back to the back of the seat. Mm. And it just it took off like a rocket and I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, holy shit. And uh like I shifted into the like third and I was at a hundred miles an hour. I was like, oh my God, this is yeah. crazy. And then um I got hooked on that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then I got to where I was just like, I, and you know how it is. It's like, you're on it. It's like, you're going 120, 130 everywhere you go. Yeah. And you get to a point where it's like, you're going 50, 60 miles an hour. It's like, you feel like you're moving like a snail. I've always said that everything fun on a sport bike is illegal. 100%. You know, it's yeah. like, you just don't, you know, you it doesn't get, like when you know that there's that level and it's just as easy as twisting that, that throttle. Yeah. And it can give you that adrenaline rush that, you know, you know, it's there. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like having a fucking your own morphine yeah. drip. You know what I mean? And you and you don't have to be a good rider. You know, if you know, if you're doing those kind of speeds, mm-hmm. like you're, you know, if you're doing 120 on a sportster, it's like, holy fuck, this is scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you, you it lets could, you know you, a little bit. Right. Okay, it's, it's it's a little bit, but you could you could be doing 130, 140 on a sport bike like one-handed yeah Yeah. one-handed easy yeah and uh so it gives you kind of actually a false reality because the engineering on that shit is so fucking good yeah um so you know i I got addicted to that and then i got to where i was like everybody else is a fucking pussy like blah blah you know and 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 got pigeonholed into like this is the only thing that's cool like everybody else sucks yeah right and then um i just it got to where um, I started sm- getting a little bit smarter, and he's like, "I don't. This shit's like I'm either gonna like kill myself or get a, a ticket, but I want a motorcycle, and I like the stance. I like the like, you know, the kind of racer kind of feel. And I was like, "What's gonna get? And I like I liked old school shit, you know. Like I said, I always wanted like a bobber or something. Yeah. And so I was like, "What's gonna give me that old school feel, but also that racy like fast kind of feel?" And I'm not going to get in that much trouble because it can't go. It's like Cafe Racer. Yeah. You know, a little CB550, whatever. And that kind of got me into that, which, and then I got into that and I'm like, cool, well, this is cool, but like, I want to go down the highway at 75 or 80. Like, what am I going to do? Well, let me get a sports store. We'll do that. Mm-hmm. Let me cafe that, 
you know, and they're cheap and they're reliable. So it just morphed into that. And then that morphed into like, oh, like, like, let me go try out some flat track stuff. Like mm-hmm. the first flat track race I did, I, had, I did on a Sportster with like clip-ons. Yeah. And I like high-sided on, on the warm-up laps. Like never been on the track. I was like, <laughs> fuck it, I'll try it. Yeah. Fucking high-sided that shit like right away. <laughs> and um, and I was like, well, maybe I should put some bars on this thing. You know, so I put some tracker bars on it. And it's like, you know, it just morphed into me digging deeper and deeper and changing how I rode and changing what I rode and mm-hmm. building accordingly. And then just kind of opened my mind up to everything yeah yeah that's what it does man i mean the 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 thing if you i always say this if you if you plan to have a lifelong marriage to motorcycles then you have to be open-minded to change and trying new shit and adapting to new things like it's highly unlikely that your first bike is going to be the forever bike for you right. or style a bike yep and you never know what what the scene's going to do, how it's going to change, and you know, and, and I think every dude's full of shit when they act like they're not influenced by other people. I'm like, dude, if I see if I see you rolling down the highway on any bike, and I'm like, that's f- like a cinematic view of a motorcycle, and like I'm gonna be like, I fucking want one now. That looks cool as shit. I want to I want to look that cool on the highway. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like people just uh, they they got to be a little less married to their tribalism. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's I, a natural I have it. instinct. Yeah. It's a natural thing. And I, and I have it myself. You know, I, I, you get me a couple more beers deep and I'm, I'm sitting here like fuck everything. T bars or fuck off, you know? Yeah. yeah. But at the same time, ultimately like while I'm still happy right now, <laughs> I think that, uh, everything is cool. And I think that everybody that's a builder would do well by studying, everything in every genre of motorcycles because you can pull from it and create new shit new trends that are literally things that are already in the world but they just you haven't found the, the marriage yep. between those two styles i've my never style i've never paint, built a chopper but mm-hmm. some of my favorite builders are chopper builders exactly mine too i always tell people my paint like my style that mm-hmm. i've i'm known for is the marriage of low rider style paint jobs and race car helmets Mm. and you put those two together mm-hmm. and you got elements of old lace and flake and candy and leaf and then you got these sharp edges and points and and racy numbers graphics and, and numbers yeah. and and personalization there. And it's like and that's what stuff. my that's what i that's my style yeah i didn't create either one of those exactly and i didn't really create the emergence of it but i'm just known for that well that's what everything you know? is you know i mean the fact that a motorcycle is still like two wheels and a seat yeah they kinda, tried to add more wheels, but it didn't work out. You're right. It kind of blows my mind. Did you see that? Uh, was it Honda or Kawasaki that made that one that that it was had a, the f- two wheels in the front? In the front, but it was it was still a motorcycle. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't like one of those spider or whatever yeah, yeah. those stills are. Did you ever read about that thing? I didn't read it. I uh, just saw it and scrolled past. It's what happens when engineers get bored. Mm. Like I, I I read a little bit about it, and it was like. They start talking about the technology about it, and uh, it is crazy. It's like, um, y- you know, you ever ridden, like, uh, uh, rain and stuff, and that front wheel wants to, like, dive out yeah, and stuff. Yeah. It's like you're, tr- you're like, doubling your traction on your front wheel. Mm-hmm. And so it's, like, excellent control and, like, shitty weather, basically. And, and the fact how it leaned together, it's like, holy shit, like, that you know it's like yeah we will everyone will hate on that shit and everyone will talk a bunch of shit and then try to convince you how they're fucking cool or how they're different but at, it's like no that person who created that they're actually different mm. it's like yeah everyone's gonna hate on it and not like it and yeah that thing was ugly as fuck but you know what there's not much new that you see in the motorcycle world and yeah. that was something very new and someone thinking way outside the fucking box. Yeah. And usually the people that are really actually pushing shit forward and thinking way out the box are the people that are hated on the most. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, and, and you know, that are way outside the, the realm of, like you said, like tribalism. Like they're really trying to create something new. Yeah. Like I'm not creating anything fucking new, dude. It's like, yeah, I'm building a lot of shit out of nothing Mm -hmm. out of sheet metal or whatever but i'm not making anything new it's like yeah it's got my little twist on it it's got a little bit of my taste on it 
you know it's like when i've made music and 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 laid down drum tracks and stuff it's like yeah they're they're unique to me and it's a m- melting pot of all the Your influences, influences yeah. that i have but dude i'd be an idiot to say i'm making anything new yeah, yeah. you know what i mean um, but when people actually do make something new, when they do make something totally different off the wall, they usually just hate it on so hard. Yeah, for sure. Well, motorcycling brings out the most tribalism in every community, right? Because a lot of the people that ride motorcycles, it becomes their identity. Yep. And with that being said, it's like you get something that they've just got the bike that, that they told themselves was going to make them the coolest guy in the scene. And now everybody's like not into that anymore and that guy's like fighting like no fuck that it's this or die you know what i mean yeah, like everybody yeah, yeah. you know what i mean yeah. i i've been that way and that's how i know this, this i was that way exists. with sport bikes when yeah. i was a fucking dumbass you know 17 to 20 year old yeah you know i mean still a dumbass to this day but it's like less and less i'm, I'm just trying to be more aware and like yeah. check myself and just see how things work but yeah for sure um no, there there is a lot of that and it's dumb and it's like why die on on some stupid hill yeah you know it's like be open to all of it and and be crit and just really be able to like uh, uh, acknowledge and and praise people when when they're doing something different, whether you even like how it looks or not. Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's like you 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 cannot like how something looks. You cannot uh, or you, you can like disagree with certain things, but but still respect like the the amount of work and craftsmanship that went into something yeah like you know that that's the point everyone should be at it's like you know what it's like <clears throat> that bike it's like it's not what i would build it's not my taste it's not what i would like but fuck did that guy do a goddamn good yeah. job i mean is that shit not amazing it's like you, people aren't able to separate that they're not a it's like just because you like it or not doesn't that's not a, a factor of whether it's good or not yeah and i think a lot of people have a hard time separating that it's like well i don't like it so it's not good mm. it's like no you you should get to a point where you can tell like that's fucking good but it do, it, it, doesn't it doesn't ring my bell it doesn't appeal to you yeah. it doesn't appeal you know overall but you know you got to be able to separate those things especially when it comes to anything creative yeah for sure well dude we gotta we gotta wrap it you up you gotta get going home yeah i gotta I, I gotta 45 minute tear down probably here still <laughs> i just had enough beers to like Feel make good. me want to like go to the go bar on, yeah you know what i mean <laughs> it's like now i'm ready to go tease yeah now i'm awake i was ready to fall asleep when you got here yeah same i had to go eat a fucking snickers bar and a monster for the third one today <laughs> trying to because i've been up since like 4 a.m so oh, shit, but no i appreciate it man like for, i'm glad that we know each other now and uh yeah, yeah dude if you want to come up to dallas we'll fucking we'll go hard in, in the shop I'm ready, dude. So, Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. I mean, I'll, uh, I'm definitely going to be up there um, in the off season. A lot of us guys go ride at the stockyards because that that goes on every weekend all yeah. year round. So, um, you know, I need to go up stockyards and get on some Bronx and try to stay sharp and maybe, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll stop in. Oh, for sure, man. And uh, I guess for everybody to know, like, they can check out your personal, your all your different pages. I think you got three. Yeah. I got I got too many pages. So uh, my personal, which is kind of what I'm active on now, is uh, Colt um, Wrangler, Colt dot Wrangler. Uh, my motorcycle page is uh, Colt Wrangler dot co. This is all on Instagram, yeah. and then um, the podcast. Uh, podcast is uh, Colt Wrangler dot radio. It's on Spotify, iTunes, all that shit. Nice. Colt Wrangler Radio. Check it out. Um, uh, working full time at Revival Cycles now in Austin, Texas. So yeah. check out Revival Cycles. Uh, and this you know, place is rad. I also went to the other spot on uh, Congress. Just a nice little the like, retail store. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty dope. You Dude, know it's I mean? fan. It's a different. Th- I mean, you walk in here. The, there's a Ferrari F40 on the lift yeah. right now. Like uh, that's that's a two million dollar car. Yeah, it's like it's just a different level of clientele. Like just a different level yeah. of everything. And I'm like, I feel very privileged that you know they came to me and offered me a job, and for me to be fabricating here now is is yeah, really cool. Awesome. Um, you know, handbelt show. Uh, I mean, a lot of you guys already know about it. That's how I know about these guys. Um, you know, submit your builds right now. If you want to get a build in a handbelt show, it's filling up quick. You better like submit now. And that's usually in April, right? Mm hmm. Nice. Yep. Yeah. And is it uh, coinciding with the, uh, with the, uh, MotoGP? MotoGP this year? I believe so. Nice. As far as I know, I don't know. COVID screwed everything up yeah. when, but, um, but yeah, check all that stuff out. Um, uh, you know, uh, shout out to the bands I've played in, uh, 
you know, Danella Drive and uh, the Drop Tines. Uh, they're still going strong. Check out their music. And uh, if you see me out there at a show or something, come say hi. Let's hang out. Let's drink some beers. Hell yeah. All right. Thanks, bud. Yes, I sir. appreciate it.